Good evening and welcome to the COVID Coercion and Conscience Symposium. I want to start with a number of thank yous, especially to our speakers, musicians, organizers, the deacons and other aspects of our security team, the AV, the culinary arts, the church staff, and also for the denominational administrators that have made this weekend uh, doable. I also want to thank everyone who had the courage uh, to write or call me and talk to me directly about any encouragement or concerns they had for this weekend. For indeed, this is uh, the, the way of Christ. Much has been mentioned over the last few months about Leviticus 19 and the quote of Jesus to love your neighbor as yourself. But the entire context of that message is this. You should not hate your fellow countrymen in your heart. You may surely reprove your neighbor, but you shall not incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. In other words, God is calling us to talk out and to live out the love of Jesus. The goal of this weekend is fourfold. Number one, to strengthen Christians in a biblical understanding of the issues of conscience and coercion as it relates to the current mandates for various COVID vaccines. Number two, to understand and enable early treatment of COVID, thus empowering the individual to be responsible and, pro and proactive in protecting both his own and her own, along with the community health. Number three, to inform regarding issues of legality and exemption in regards to government or employer compulsion or force, which are often referred to as mandates. And to address the insecurity and imbalance of our postmodern media world, which has resulted in the oppression of free speech and discussion regarding issues of paramount importance to the personal and civic health of our country and its citizens. We believe that the metrics of mental health, social well-being, educational advancement, and economic realities on a national and individual level, including the fundamental right to livelihood, require an honest and full-spectrum approach to the pandemic. We believe that the overt or covert threatenings of licensure and suppression of medical discussion regarding early treatment and the off-label use of drugs is an unmeasured catastrophe of the past 15 months. To be clear, this weekend is not an anti-vaccination event. The presenters represent various levels of caution or confidence in the current COVID vaccines. Some of our presenters are vaccinated against COVID, some have already experienced the disease, and some have not. The emphasis of this weekend is built around the medical mandate of, and these are very important words, especially if you're a medical person, informed consent. These are two concepts that protect the health and the well-being of individuals and nations. Unfortunately, the current media landscape makes a proper understanding of informed consent very difficult. Navigating between news agencies and websites sifting for the truth can be overwhelming. Perhaps we should not be surprised that this is not an entirely new situation. The life and times of Jesus were surrounded by similar circumstances. The stewards of cultural messaging were unsettled by the organic popularity of this grassroots messianic movement. Eventually, the boldness of the Sanhedrin knew no bounds and it exercised itself in a mandate for all who, who knew of the whereabouts of Jesus to report it for his subsequent arrest. That can be found in Luke 11:57. What's unusual about this situation is that right when the Pharisees and Sadducees felt powerful enough to reach out and take control and declare Jesus an outlaw, the triumphal entry was just around the corner by a few days, and the masses would declare him their hero. But before the week ended, Jesus was in their grasp and headed for the cross. Only one man stood between the Christ and his crucifixion, and that was the Roman governor. And now, 
we, like Pilate, are compelled to ask, what is truth? The answer was not so dependent on the words of Jesus as it was the character of the questioner. Now, I want you to think about that. The essence of all truth stood in the presence of one that was more righteous than the Pharisees and Sadducees who had brought him there. And yet his heart was not set on truly following truth. John, the gospel writer, announces that the light shone in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. One is compelled to ask, how can such things be? The unfolding answer of his gospel is the story of self-imposed blindness to Jesus, the Messiah, who was the light of the world. This is a condition from which it is almost impossible to recover. In other words, truth is a function of the heart in desire more than it is a set of data. And while we are scientific and believe in the pursuit of data, we understand that it is all interpreted. And that interpretation might depend on character and courage as much as anything else. For as much as information matters in times like these, the spirit of a man or a woman of truth recognizes and responds to the spirit of truth even before it can completely analyze and evaluate the subject matter at hand. In other words, birds of a feather will indeed flock together, and there is something to be said about wanting to hear the truth before you can see and accept the truth. If a mind is a priori decided, if it is of an opinion unchangeable, then we're back to the age-old adage, don't confuse, confuse me with the facts, my mind is already made up. This element of character will be central as a dividing and deciding issue at the end of times. In the great controversy, the author describes a situation in the last days when the examination of data will yield only partial benefit to its examiner. Genuine miracles and demonic deceptions of the same nature will have flooded the landscape of planet Earth. On page 612, this is what she writes. Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. But there is a problem. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men, according to Revelation 13, 13. Thus the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. At some level, how unfortunate that the data will be all over the board and indisputable at some level. It will be a competing narrative with competing interpretations and a competing set of data will be before every human being. And with a complete chokehold on the venues of communication, God's people will be reduced to face-to-face -to -face and in-person giving of the final message of warning and hope. Why is this? It appears that now, as of old and in the future, the spirit of truth must connect with a person of truth in order for it to be recognizable. And of course, where we start and where we finish may be very different, like the Apostle Paul, formerly as Saul, who was an enemy of the gospel and then its greatest proponent. And just like today, at the very end, everyone will be freighted with the responsibility of making their own decision, of recognizing the spirit of truth, even if they can't crunch all the data. The spirit of truth is humble, which allows for dialogue and examination. It is respectful, which critiques ideas and not people. It is patient because it understands the eventual triumph of right. It is courageous, knowing the rarity and fragility of liberty. It is bold, which is without fear and trusting the source of all truth. And it is willing to suffer, 
to experience the cost of intellectual and spiritual integrity in an age of darkness and oppression. When Solomon was confronted with the mystery of the harlot mothers, he faced a similar situation. Before summoning the soldier and the sword, he surveyed the character of the women before him. One was coarse and calloused, one was heartbroken and grieving. The contrived appearance of an execution was simply an amplification of the impress of the spirit of the true mother on the king. Solomon was taking a calculated risk, but not too much of a risk, for he knew that real love would suffer. The real mother would rather look into the eyes of her own child in the arms of an evil woman and grieve day after day than to see its lifeless form on the palace floor. And, she, and Solomon said, give her the child. She's the real mother. We cannot indemnify, which means put beyond the reach of accountability, the pharmaceutical companies and vilify those who have concerns. Ad hominem attacks are neither befitting to intellectual culture or the rational examination of ideas to say nothing of the higher standards of Christian deportment and the spirit of truth. This weekend is designed to help honest people make informed choices. It's predicated on a belief that there are a variety of ways to care for public health and allow for human agency over one's body. This weekend is in harmony with the voted policy of the Seventh-day Adventist Church as published in the Adventist Review, and it desires to protect and respect the pursuit of truth. As a young woman in her early 20s, not of my faith, said to me on Wednesday afternoon of this week, the process of deciding whether or not to get a vaccination should include all the important information, such as what exactly the vaccine is, what exactly the vaccine does, every possible outcome or side effect. The process of decision-making should not be manipulated by incentives of winning money, getting free beer, or donuts. <laughs> God demonstrates his love towards us, she went on to say, by not only telling us the truth, but by giving us the freedom to make our own decisions, fully aware of the consequences. The last two sentences, quoting this young woman, the issue isn't whether or not the vaccine is good or bad. The issue is access to the whole truth encompassing the vaccine and the freedom to decide based on that truth. Because the COVID vaccines are the current extension of compulsion and force, and because many respected physicians, scientists, and healthcare workers, along with a whole host of ordinary citizens, have concerns. The vaccine itself will be the subject of discussion at times, but it is not the focus of the weekend. Liberty of conscience, early treatment, and liberty of the press are its focus. All questions for the weekend have been submitted prior to the event. The speakers will not be available for personal consultation. References and materials will be available on our website at the conclusion of the event. We solicit your prayers and appeal to the nobility of Christ that the weekend may proceed as a model for honest and respectful dialogue. Let us pray. Lord, our nation is in the grips of fear. And sometimes it's fear of open dialogue. Sometimes it's fear of exposure. Sometimes it's fear of sickness and death. I'm praying now, Lord, that your spirit would descend on this body, on those watching online, and that we would be people of truth. May we be willing to change our minds, alter our opinions, and follow that truth wherever it leads. This is the Protestant way. It has been the Adventist way. And liberty has been protected through the sacrifice of many to keep us in that way. So now, Lord, uh, bless our speakers, bless our listeners, take the message wherever it should go, and please protect our church from mirroring some of the proclivities of a postmodern generation. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite a dear friend of mine, but not relative, Dr. John Kelly, to come up. John is a, a physician that has assisted many in discovering a better life through lifestyle. He is the founder of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. I won't give his full bio tonight. He will be on the panel tomorrow, but we've asked him to introduce Dr. McCullough. Thank you. Thank you. It is my 
my privilege, actually, to introduce a medical colleague I've just uh, met in person this evening, but already been blessed by the time we spent together, Dr. Peter McCullough. He's an internist, a cardiologist, an epidemiologist, and has been professor of medicine at multiple universities, medical universities. I say that, I'll explain that uh, wording in just a minute. He maintains uh, board certification in internal medicine and cardiovascular disease medicine, and he practices both internal medicine and uh, including the management of common infectious diseases as well as cardiovascular complications of both the viral infection and injuries developing after uh, the COVID vaccine that occasionally occurs. Since the onset of the pandemic, Dr. McCullough has been a leader in the medical response and treatment of the COVID-19 disaster and has published uh, papers on this. Most recent one, which I have in my own files and have read and actually made a copy of figure one, by the way, to share with friends, is uh, entitled Pathophysiological Basis and Rationale for Early Outpatient Treatment of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 Infection. It's the first synthesis of sequenced multi-drug treatment of ambulatory patients infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, published in the American Journal of Medicine and subsequently updated uh, in January this year in reviews in cardiovascular medicine. Dr. McCullough has 46 peer-reviewed publications on the infection and has commented extensively on the medical response to the COVID-19 crisis in the national media. I'm sure some of you, maybe all of you, have seen him. On November 19 of 2020, Dr. McCullough testified in the U.S. Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Government Affairs, and throughout 2021, this year, in the Texas Senate Committee on Health and Human Services, the Colorado General Assembly, New Hampshire Senate, concerning many aspects of the pandemic response. Um, it's, I know from our conversation that this list is much longer than that. In fact, uh, the short time we were talking uh, this evening, he had multiple uh, contacts and, and interaction, people of this nature, uh, contacting him and asking for information, etc. So Dr. McCullough has had a full year of dedicated academic and clinical efforts in combating the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and in doing so has reviewed thousands of reports, participated in scientific congresses, group discussions, press releases, and, has been cons and is considered among the world's experts on COVID-19. And I would like to share just one personal note to this very academic introduction uh, is that one of the things that impresses me most as I've gotten acquainted with him through email and in person is that Dr. McCullough is one of the individuals that's really willing to put it all on the line. I won't, I'll let him tell you if he wants to some of the things, but he has experienced personally the very real things that any of you who stand up know happens. And it's not simple simply getting canceled, it gets a lot worse than that. So I just want to thank you, Dr. McCullough, for coming. Thank you for standing for principle. Well, th thanks for the introduction, and thanks to each and every one of you for attending. I don't know how I can uh, stand up to that introduction. Um, but I do have to say, uh, I think it is an amazing time to be alive right now. You know, for better or for worse, and it's been uh, the worst for a lot of us, it's been the worst. It is, uh, uh, something is going on right now in the world, and in our little part of the world here in Michigan, I lived in Michigan a long time, um, that, everyone has to recognize 
that this is really different than all the other years of our lives. And I'll never forget when this started and we were having these press briefings and Trump was getting up there and saying, you know, if we just get to Easter, if we just get to Easter, we just, it's going to be over with. And I was, uh, when this first hit, you know, I wasn't, I didn't really follow the SARS-1 pandemic very much, but I talked to uh, a couple of my colleagues in Canada who I knew. I said, you guys were hit by SARS. How long did this last? I mean, we are wearing these smothering N95 masks. He goes, oh, we had to wear N95s for about 90 days when it was over with. And I said, oh, Trump's pretty good. 90 days, it'll be Easter. It'll be over with. Boy, was that wrong, huh? So um, as introduced, I'm an internist and cardiologist. I'm an academic physician uh, my entire life, but I see and examine patients every day. Uh, I'm the editor-in-chief of two major journals, uh, Reviews in Cardiovascular Medicine and Cardiorenal Medicine. I'm the president of Cardiorenal Society of America, so as you may get an idea, I study the interface between heart and kidney disease. And as, as part of my uh, uh, lifetime, I came to Michigan in uh, 1991, and I was on a rural health-supported uh, program. I was up in Grayling. I covered uh, medicine with Chuck um, uh, Wilkinson, who came from Duke. I came from University of Washington. I trained at Baylor in, in Texas and then UT Southwestern. I did my residency at University of Washington in Seattle, so I was really gunning away. Uh, Chuck, my partner, had trained at Duke. Uh, we were recruited to come up to Grayling, and we covered uh, Grayling um, in Roscommon County, and we covered uh, down to uh, Gladwin and over to Kalkaska. You know, we were kind of back in the, in the early 90s, there was a physician shortage up, up north, and so we went up there uh, in order to get our student loans paid back, and we got great experience. Most people did, I feel like I'm echoing a bit, uh, most of us uh, did service and um, after residency back then, so it was, it was not uncommon. In Seattle, a lot of our residents became uh, CDC officers, which is interesting now since we interact so much with the CDC. Um, but after that, I went to, thanks, oh, th that'll probably do it. Um, after that, I uh, went to University of Michigan, School of Public Health, and I got my degree in epidemiology and uh, went on and trained at Beaumont Hospital in cardiology, which is now Beaumont School of Medicine. And I had leadership positions here in Michigan for a long time. I was division chief at William Beaumont, and I was the chief academic scientific officer for all of Ascension Health up here uh, before I returned to Texas to finish my career at Baylor. But when COVID-19 hit, and I had been focusing on chronic diseases, I realized that this was our medical Super Bowl. And it didn't take me too long to figure this out. I said, listen, something is big happening. There's, this is probably bigger than anything any doctor had seen. And while I was trying to process what was going on, uh, we had a calamity up here in our family. My wife's cousin, uh, her daughter, Kim, was working at a CVS in Livonia as a pharmacist early in March. And back then there were no masks and probably people didn't know what's going on. Kim was seven months pregnant and she came down with a fever, had trouble breathing, goes to University of Michigan, delivers the baby uh, at seven months precipitously, and then she goes on the ventilator and dies. Still to this day, we don't know if it's COVID-19 because the tests at that level, if, 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 if the test could determine uh, a level of positivity at 200 copies, back then it was copies per uh, uh, volume of, of fluid, if the test was positive as 2000, that means that 1890 it was negative. And so nowadays that test would have been clearly positive and she, was, she died of COVID-19. And you, you know, she never saw her, you know, never saw her husband again. I mean, it's, 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 it, that's how this whole thing started. So I looked at this personally and I said, this is our medical Super Bowl and we better see some action. And we better see some mass casualty units, places like University of Michigan and Beaumont and Baylor. Boy, they better start to have field hospitals and start treating people. Otherwise, we're going to have a ton of people being admitted to the hospital and people going on the ventilator and dying. Where's the field hospitals? Where are they? Wait a minute, then things started happening. Patients started getting sick. They started calling their doctors. The doctors say, well, there's no treatment for COVID. We can't treat this problem. We don't treat it. You know, and, and, and then patients started, this is the first time in my life that I've ever seen doctors not treat a problem. And my interpretation was it was out of fear. 
that, oh, let's not get our offices contaminated. Let's, we don't know how to treat this. Let's not, let's not get our waiting rooms. I was on a lot of these uh, tactical calls for our center, and uh, the calls went something like this. Uh, where do we get enough masks to protect ourselves? Where do we get enough hazmat suits to protect ourselves? Uh, how do we get people on the ventilator early so we can cap off the air so the virus doesn't spray all over the place? So let's put the patients on the ventilator early. These discussions were, they, they were just absolutely horrifying to hear. And it became clear within a month or two that, we, that the medical, the biomedical complex was not going to treat COVID, was not going to treat COVID. It was clear. Where was the field hospital in Ann Arbor? I never saw it. Or how about Michigan State? Or how about Beaumont? No, it became this situation and it became memorialized actually on October 8th of last year where the National Institutes of Health said the treatment standards are that nobody gets treatment, nobody, until they get sick enough and they can't breathe and then they come in the hospital and then even then they don't get a milligram of treatment and only when they get on oxygen can they get their first milligram of remdesivir. And when we figure this out, it takes about two to three weeks for a senior citizen to get that sick and end up. And by that time, the virus is long gone. Remdesivir doesn't do anything at that point in time. So something got into the minds of doctors and nurses and others and everyone to not treat COVID-19. I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand it. And so I worked feverishly, and I had a lot of colleagues in Italy, and we worked on this day and night, day and night, what's working, what's not working, and we realized that the virus has uh, three major phases. At first, the virus is replicating like crazy, it trips off inflammation, and then that trips off blood clotting. And in the end, when the patients die, it's micro blood clots in the lungs, and the oxygen just can't get in there. The oxygen levels uh, go down, and the patient dies. That's what happens. With those three phases, as you can imagine, viral replication, cytokine storm or inflammation, and thrombosis, no drug, no single drug is gonna work. So of course no single drug is gonna work, of course. We must use drugs in combination, we must. And in fact, we do that for HIV and hepatitis B. We even do it for staph infections. We don't rely on a single antibiotic. We always use drugs in combination. So it was gonna be combination drugs. And as we arrived at our conclusions based on what we had, we said, listen, we can't wait for large randomized trials. Uh, you know, the, the, the ivory tower doctors were saying, listen, well, we must wait for large randomized trials, which take two to five years. I mean, that's a long time. That's a lot of people dying over two to five years, quote, waiting for randomized trials. And when it became clear, the National Institutes of Health, we're not gonna do any treatment trials of people in the community. The NIH only had one treatment trial, one, and they outfitted all the centers. They were going to use two simple drugs. They outfitted all the centers. They had it set up. They said, ready, set, go, I think in May. And then by June 4th, they shut it down. They said, no, nope, uh, we can't find any patients. No patients? We were, we were swimming in patients. What do you mean no patients? So that to this day, there has been no earnest effort to try to treat Americans in some type of high-quality, well-funded, randomized trial to prevent hospitalization and death. There's only two bad things that can happen, right? If you get COVID-19, how many people here had it? There you go. It's about a third of us. I mean, what do you care about when you get COVID-19? I don't want to be put in the hospital and I don't want to die, right? It's, those, it's very simple. Those only those two outcomes. After that, can all of you take a severe cold at home, take some medicines, get through it? Yeah, have you done it before? Yeah, I'll do that. I just don't want to be in the hospital in isolation and I don't want to die. It's that simple. We, our government and other governments and the entire world has not lifted a finger to reduce the risk of hospitalization and death anywhere. Anywhere. Since when? Since when? If there was a pneumonia, a community-acquired pneumonia, oh, we get you on antibiotics right away. How about a kid with asthma? Would we let the kid wheeze and choke for a week or two weeks before the kid has to go in the hospital? No, we give the child uh, medications. We get Medicaid, you know, we, we don't have randomized trials for every single thing we do. It's been estimated in my field in cardiology, we only have about 6% of our decisions that are based on randomized trials. Medicine is an art and a science. It takes judgment. And what was happening is out of, I think, global fear, 
no judgment was being applied. No one looked at this as a mass casualty situation. I'll tell you somebody who did, Didier Rialt in France, in Matthew Milan. They said, listen, this is, they, out in Milan, they set up a field hospital. They said, let's open up a tent and let's start treating French, because you know, if you go down to the French Riviera, it's all the retired French, there are a lot of seniors down there. Let's start treating the seniors in the tent and try some simple combinations of medicines and see if we can reduce the risk of hospitalization and death. You know what the French government did to him? House arrest. You can't make this stuff up. And it just keeps going and going and going. You know what they did in Australia? They put on the books, early in April, a new rule. It says, if a doctor attempts to help a patient with COVID-19 with prescribing an outpatient medicine, and the medicine was of interest then, hydroxychloroquine, that doctor could be punished with imprisonment. Since when does a doctor get put in prison to try to help a patient with a simple generic drug? You know what they did in France with Rialt? Hydroxychloroquine was over the counter. They made a prescription, and then they restricted the ability to dispense it. Since that time, there has been a doctor put in jail in South Africa for using ivermectin, another drug that looked promising. Since when do doctors face imprisonment in their trying to help patients? Listen, we try with a lot of different drugs at first in medicine until we figured out. We did it with HIV. I remember I was in the University of Washington in Seattle when HIV hit. We tried a lot of stuff in combination. I remember I was at Beaumont Hospital the very first time we put in stents. Do you, anybody here has a stent? I have to tell you, at Beaumont Hospital, when we first started doing this in the 1990s, we gave people six blood thinners because we were terrified that the stent was gonna clog. And then we did studies and studies, and then we narrowed it down. We got down to two that works, aspirin and Plavix, probably some are you on it because you've had a stent, and we figured it out. That took about 17 years, by the way, to figure it out. At first, we don't have the research. We need judgment, and we have to put drugs in combination. I published the first set of doing it, as mentioned, in the American Journal of Medicine, it went viral. It's still the most heavily downloaded and relied upon paper in all of COVID-19 for outpatient treatment, period. Me, you're looking at them. How come it wasn't somebody at University of Michigan? Wait a minute. When I published that paper, when I published that paper, there were 55,000 papers in the peer-reviewed literature, not a single one cleared up the confusion and just gave a program of what you should do. And then when I published the second one in December of 2020, we actually had data on monoclonal antibodies provided through us through uh, Operation Warp Speed. We had ivermectin, we had colchicine, wonderful trial in Canada. So now we had a whole bunch of drugs we can use in combination. And that paper is now the basis of the home treatment guide. And uh, for, fortunately, we now we have some physician organizations that have really become de novo organizations to step up and treat patients where the ivory tower today still is not treating patients. The party line in my health system is, do not treat a COVID-19 patient as an outpatient. Wait for them to get sick enough to come in because my health system, and probably like University of Michigan and Michigan State and where else, follows the National Institutes of Health or follows the Center for Disease Control, period. So this was a lot of backdrop for what happened. So Americans waited for the virus to hunt us. And if some of us got sick and we had no treatment, we could get sick enough where we end up in the hospital. And worse yet, we would die. So we became conditioned, after about May or so, wear a mask, wait in isolation, and be saved by the vaccine. And wait for the vaccine, and wait for the vaccine. And all we could hear about is the vaccine. The vaccine is coming, it's coming, it's coming. And then the randomized trials came, and they were done, and things looked pretty good. Now, we learned something about the vaccines because they were very new. This wasn't gonna be any tetanus shot. It's not like a flu shot. This is brand new technology, never ever used on a broad scale in human beings than before. So the vaccines came. Can we have the slides up? I, I submitted some slides. If I don't, I can do it verbally. Here we go. So um, let's get into this about the, the vaccines. So I publish um, uh, a journal every week. What I needed, and it became clear to me, there wasn't gonna be a lot of people who were gonna step forward and do it. 
Now, as mentioned, I have 650 peer-reviewed publications in the National Library of Medicine. There may not be somebody at University of Michigan who has that. Matter of fact, I don't think there is. And there definitely isn't at Michigan State or any other place in Michigan. And I have to tell you, the reason why I have what I have is I simply outwork any human being on Earth. Okay, that's what it takes. I'm 58 years old, and I am unstoppable, okay? and unbreakable. And I tell you, when COVID-19 hit, I was not going to sit on the sidelines of the Super Bowl. I was going to get in there and do my part. And so I needed a window. I needed a window. The publications were slowing down. Something was wrong. Something was wrong. We were publishing. We had valid papers. Nothing was getting through the ring in Journal of Medicine. There was a falsified paper published in Lancet. Since when does that happen? Something disturbing started happening. Just like the medical institutions were not treating patients, the medical journals became now an unreliable source for how we could deal with things because things weren't getting through. So there started to become a panic. So for the last year, I had a window to America through the Hill, through a journal in Washington for an entire year when I predicted everything that was going to happen through the pandemic and was trying to forecast for a variety of people. At one point in time, I was advising, I think, 12 different committees on the House side and heavily advising the Senate side behind the scenes because they weren't happy with what they were hearing from the NIH, CDC, and other agencies. And so this year, the Hill shut down when the Hill basically said, listen, we're going to have to part ways here because December 10th hit, and December 10th is a very important time in this whole history of things. I told you, there was a thirst developed for the vaccine, and there was a preparation developed for the vaccine, and this is all in the open. This is in the open. I think around December 10th, the Trusted News Initiative was announced. Go look at it on your website. You can look it up right now. The Trusted News Service and the BBC is who's announced it, but everyone was on board, CNN, CNBC, ABC, the media, the local media. And it said, we are going to only produce information and publish information that promotes vaccines and the use of vaccines, and we're gonna squash anything that could create vaccine hesitancy, period. That means early treatment, we don't want to hear about that because that could make people maybe look for other options, squash it. We're going to squash anything on vaccine safety. We don't want, if the vaccines cause a problem, we don't want to hear about it, and it's not allowed. Squash. And the, the medical director of YouTube came out and said, we're with it. Zuckerberg came out on all the social media, Twitter, we're with it. Everybody, so this is wide out in the open. So the whole world knew they were going to get only one story on the vaccine. It's good for you. Take it. It's in the wide open. So I needed a window, and the window was America Out Loud, and I, I publish this once a week, and I have been telling America through this window about the products. And the first one was a new biologic products. Of course, demand safety, safety, safety. If for the first time we're gonna roll out a vaccine, and we're gonna literally ask the entire country to take it, it better be safe. Period. Period. Nothing less than safe. Nothing less than safe. In medicine, we use a term called primum no nocere. That means above all, do no harm. Do no harm. It is unacceptable because we, there's no way that we can know in the short time frame that we have if the vaccines are going to work. We just don't know. We cannot know if they're going to work. So if we're going to give it a shot, it better be safe. It has to be safe. That's the only option. It must be safe. And that's what the, the um, genesis of that paper was. And we had background. We knew from the swine flu pandemic, 1976, we tried this. We gave a vaccine for the swine flu back then. It was an older technology vaccine. And we gave it. In that time, we had 220 million people in the United States. We got to vaccinating 55 million Americans and at the time this came out, deaths were being reported. And we were keeping track of it in the United States. We got to 25 deaths. We got to 25 deaths in 1976. Some of you remember this. And after months of negative media coverage, then the story of Guillain-Barre came out. And that's an ascending paralysis that was happening. President Ford was uh, in office at the time. And only 20% of the population was vaccinated. 550 cases of Guillain-Barre, 25 deaths. 
and the government offered liability coverage to cover the pharmaceutical manufacturers, and there were hundreds of compensation claims, and the program was shut down at 20. It turns out it evolved to 53 deaths. This became the standard. This is kind of the acceptability of deaths that we would ever accept with a medical product. Do you know if a new drug comes on the market and there's five unexplained deaths, the standard is to say what's called black box warning. It says warning, may cause death. Anybody ever see a TV commercial for some common drug? It says warning, may cause death. It can happen. It can be a rare thing that happens, but that's fair. Five deaths, a black box warning. 50 deaths for a product, it's gone. That's our tolerance for a product, 50 deaths. We can't explain it. Listen, we are premium no nursery. Above all, a drug or a product will do no harm. Very, very important. Well, what do we have? These vaccines now are brand new technology, and I want you to be aware of it. The old technology was we could give a dead virus, we could give a crippled virus called a live attenuated virus, or we give a protein, which is dead. Uh, all of you have had a tetanus shot. That's just a protein. You can't be hurt by it, it's just a protein. We could get you know, allergic reaction to it, but it's not gonna do anything outside of produce immunity. So you get a protein shot, hepatitis B. I get that in cardiology. We got 98% of Americans take all the vaccines. We have about 70 vaccines on the market, about 278 million shots a year. So listen, we, we know about this. And 98% of us say, okay, we're gonna do it. As, as a cardiologist, I gotta take hepatitis B, influenza, I took these shots this year, fine. These are different. The shown on the left is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. This is an adenoviral vector, so this is actually kind of a, a crippled virus, but it's loaded with a genetic payload called adenoviral DNA that codes for the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The spike protein was the subject of the gain of function research done in the Wuhan lab in China. And the spike protein was specifically designed with that research, it's got a hinge joint, so that hinge would lock into a human receptor and then allow the virus to get in. That's called the furin cleavage joint. It was designed that way. The spike protein was designed to make the virus infect and kill. It's pretty clear. And Rand Paul is on this, and he's on Fauci, and he knows it. And you can see the tension, okay? So this, these, this genetic um, uh, material here, if I can point to this screen, I don't know if I can, but the genetic material here, I guess I'll go forward. The genetic material shown in there, a little spiral, let me go back. Um, just go back one, that's the Baylor consent form. Yeah, the genetic material on the left, that's the code, that's the code for the spike protein. And it's the code for the original spike protein, the wild type spike protein. Because it was made. The spike protein wasn't man-made, it was naturally occurring on the coronavirus. It basically was made to be lethal. Otherwise, there's no way a coronavirus is gonna be lethal, okay? On the left is messenger RNA. Now this is a technology where now the message that codes for the spike protein is made synthetically. It has what's called nucleoside caps on it to make it more durable. Normally in your body, you unzip D DNA, you make some RNA, it goes out, it's a message, you actually have transfer RNA, and it assembles a protein. And then the RNA is digested. You're doing that right now, your body's making its own messenger RNA right now, tons of it. It's one and done. You use it, dispose it. Use it, dispose it. It's a wonderful, beautiful, God-given system in your body, okay? That's natural messenger RNA. The, but on the right there, that's messenger RNA that is made to last. And these, there were 24 of these platforms, and the dream of this, this was dreamed up in 1987, the very first paper on this. The dream of this is that it would last. And so we could treat a genetic deficiency disease like Fabry's disease. We could, we could treat uh, heart failure, cancer, that it would last. Maybe we could give an injection once a month. Maybe we can give an injection once every three months or six months, but it's long lasting. These nucleoside caps are long lasting. So when these products were thought of for a vaccine, it was a way of tricking the body into putting the genetic material in the human body and let the, let the own body make the spike protein. So instead of giving like a, a shot of spike protein, we'll trick the body into making spike protein. 
And the thought was, well, maybe it'll just stay in the arm for a day or two, and then you make some spike protein, you get a sore arm, and you're immune. But thinking about it, there's no way this is gonna stay in the arm for a day or two. If it's loaded on a lipid nanoparticle, this is gonna be distributed all through the body. And in fact, that's exactly what happens. So the consent form, this came, these, these came forward, and after only two months of observation, instead of 24 months of observation, they, in a sense, were rushed to market. It was an emergency. They skipped testing for um, uh, 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 genotoxicity, uh, whether they would cause cancer, birth defects. Not that vaccines are studied specifically that way, but they're studied over the course of about two years by law, by regulatory law, to kind of know if there's any signals. That was all skipped, and a consent form, this is my hospital, uh, came out, and they were opened up in uh, December. They, they look like they had what's called 90% vaccine efficacy over two short months, but the rates of infection in both the placebo and the treatment group were way less than 1%. So they recruited patients that were very fastidious, and they weren't coming in contact with COVID. So we never really knew if they were. Tom says it's an investigational medicine. Investigation means research, invest studied. So those of you who took the vaccine, and about 70% of my patients took the vaccine, and my family members took the vaccine, they are participating in research, the consent form, and this is the standard, and they may be a minor inconvenience, like a sore arm or fever. So this should be kind of a warning. That, and, this, and so the consent form to this day, kind of high-risk group, and you're really, you know, COVID's gonna wipe you out. I've always thought the vaccine program would be 5, 10, maybe 15, 20 million people, maybe high-risk seniors, nursing home workers, where there was clear outbreak like this, and suddenly um, uh, the virus spread. It just didn't work that way. Well, the concerns are that the mechanism of action of the messenger RNA or the adenoviral DNA is the production of the spike protein. The spike protein is now known itself to be dangerous. When you have DNA come into your body or RNA and you direct your body to make a foreign dangerous protein, it's gonna damage the cells, it's gonna be expressed on the cell surface, the body's gonna attack those cells, and if it breaks free in the circulation, which it does, we've learned later on, it circulates in the body freely for about two weeks before the second shot tamps it down. We now have data suggesting it lasts longer. Uh, a report, we gotta confirm it, but it looks like they found it within cells nine months later. That means it persists and it's passed down to daughter cells after cell division it's starting to get uncomfortable that these shots may be lasting way longer than what we thought. Uh, it's demonstrated that it's in blood and body fluids. So that means when someone donates blood, spike protein, if they're recently vaccinated, we've alerted the Red Cross and the American Association of Blood Banking. They're, you know, nobody's expressing large concerns, but I have one. No genotoxicity, teratogenicity. There's a concerning biodistribution study uh, that the Japanese, uh, uh, when Pfizer approached Japan, you know, the J Japanese are very discerning. And when the J and Pfizer approached the Japanese, the Japanese said, well, where does this go in the body? And I said, well, the Salk Institute says it stays in the arm. And the Japanese said, why don't you show us where it goes in the body? Because there were previous Chinese studies showing these lipid nanoparticles that all the vaccines are loaded on that they distribute widely through the body. Lipid nanoparticles that they should go into the brain, organs, especially organs that make hormones. So the Japanese did, a, uh, the Pfizer did a study in animals that showed that it did distribute in animals, the nanoparticles did, and they concentrated in the adrenal glands and washed out in ovaries, and they kept concentrating in the ovaries over time. Very concerning. Separately, Moderna, the, emergency, the European Medical Association asked Moderna, show us whether or not these influence fertility, because you may want to vaccinate you know, childbearing women at some point in time. FDA did not want childbearing women to be vaccinated, so they were excluded from the studies. So, but Moderna did a study in animals, and it dropped fertility in animals. Makes sense. Lipid nanoparticles go to the ovaries, they start producing spike protein there, all it's gonna do is damage the ovaries. So when we put this together, women are describing changes in their periods, uh, that's very, very concerning for the biodistribution and potentially for fertility. There's been no external critical event committee, data safety monitoring board, or human ethics committee. When there's a large clinical investigation, and listen, I do this for a living, and I chair data safety monitoring boards for the big pharma and for the FDA and for the uh, um, NIH, we always have independent safety committees. We always do. We have to have safety. If there's nobody watching safety, remember the CDC and the, NA and the uh, FDA are the sponsors of the program. Somebody has to watch them. 
Somebody has to watch them. These people's careers are dependent on the success of the program. Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J, they're hands off right now. This is the government running a research program. Somebody needs to supervise the government. Where's the committees? They don't exist. Uh, there's been no restriction in the properly excluded trials. If we exclude pregnant women from a research study in the registrational trials, we would never use a product on a pregnant woman. Never. Never. If, let's say there's a new seizure medicine and it looks promising, would we just kind of wing it in a pregnant woman? No way. We have pregnancy categories, and, and, you know, A, B, C, D. We actually have, this, was preg this would be pregnancy category X. Never be, she should be used in a pregnant woman by uh, regulatory uh, law. Uh, COVID survivors previously immune, excluded from the study, should not receive the vaccine. No effort to restrict the vaccination according to risk for COVID-19. Uh, that I, the, the idea is that, uh, it, you know, should, like any drug, do we just give a drug to everybody or do we give it to people who really need it? Of course, we only give a drug to people who really need it. And there's been no attempts to mitigate risk for the public. And I think this is the most disturbing thing. Today, I had a, a telephone call from the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board who called me and said, what is the deal with these vaccines? We're trying to figure out the mandate. And I said, well, you, you would have to agree. We're, we're eight months into this program. There's yet to be a press briefing on how the vaccines are doing by the FDA or CDC. No information on safety and no information on efficacy. We got three, we got three vaccines. If you're gonna mandate them, what I told him, I said, if you're gonna mandate a vaccine, which one are you gonna mandate? Isn't there a winner? Isn't there a loser? They can't all be the same. Which one's holding out the best? Which one is the least safe? Which one's the most safe? Americans like to make choices. And so that doesn't make sense, right? We always make choices, but in this one, the idea is just take the shot and be quiet. Well, on January 22nd, and some of you have seen this scoreboard, this is called Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. This is an overlay called Open VARs. It's, open, uh, it's, it's updated once a month. It's uh, been uh, uh, critically reviewed and, and verified and vetted, so this scoreboard is real. I can tell you, across, across um, uh, all vaccines per year, uh, ambiently, we would get 158 deaths reported into the data system. And by January 22nd, we were already at 182 deaths with the vaccine, and we had 27 million people vaccinated. We already crossed a line of concern January 22nd. And if there was a data safety monitor board, I know because I do this work, we would have had an emergency meetings and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, people are dying after the vaccine. We got to figure out why, or we got to do an investigation. Who is it? Is it the old people, young people? Were we vaccinating people who weren't supposed to be vaccinated? Is it diabetics, those who previously recovered, people who had Parkinson's disease, people who had heart disease? Who's dying after the vaccine? January 22nd, 182 deaths. Who's dying? We didn't hear any word, so there, there was a great concern. I personally missed this. I personally didn't develop my concern because nobody else raised concern. I didn't hear anybody from University of Michigan. I didn't hear anybody from UT Southwestern or Harvard or Johns Hopkins. There was no mention. There was no mention of concern. I personally missed it, but looking backwards, the signal was there. And you can see the other things that were happening. 455 Americans in the hospital, other people going to urgent care visits. There were 106 kind of severe reactions. We know people can have reactions after shots. And then you can see what happens. If you look at all deaths reported into vaccines per year, we're around 150 per year. Meningococcus, flu shot, everything combined, all the vaccines combined. And then suddenly you can see here through July 9th, we have a skyrocketing of deaths reported after the vaccine. This is something that we've never seen in human medicine. A new product introduced and just going full steam ahead with no check on why people are dying after the vaccine. Now, on two occasions, the Center for Disease Control has put out on their website, without any fanfare, in March and in June, they have said, CDC and FDA doctors, who are the sponsors of the program, it's not their role to determine this. That's always done by external experts like me. CDC and FDA doctors reviewed the deaths and none of them were related to the vaccine. None, none including the people who get the shot and, and have an allergic reaction, they're doing CPR in the vaccine center, and that's happened, that's happened, none. Even that wasn't related to the vaccine. And that, and that first one that came out in March, that's when I got a sick feeling in my stomach. And I said, you know, something's not right here. 
th- th- that actually, I think, I think that was actually, I, I, honestly, I think that was, I think that was malfeasance. Malfeasance is wrongdoing by those in position of authority. Either they reviewed all those deaths, and somehow they came up with some, you, you know how long it takes to review 1,600 deaths? The labs, the x-rays, the charts, takes forever. It would be about a two-year experience. How could they quickly review 1,600 deaths? And who are these unnamed CDC and FDA doctors? They actually don't hire a lot of doctors who are board certified in anything. So this was really concerning. Now we go fast forward. These are data from uh, July 30th. 12,366 Americans have died after the vaccine. 46,000 hospitalized. 60. 8,000 urgent care visits, and you can see these numbers, 5,236 heart attacks, 23,534 severe allergic reactions. We have lit up a scoreboard, a safety scoreboard, that is absolutely horrifying. Look at the temporal relationship to these events, these deaths. People walk into the vaccine center, and there's a very tight temporal relationship. Previously with the vaccines, you would see vaccines reported on a timeline that was not really related to the vaccine, because some things, you know, be reported from a nursing home or for a clinic, what have you. These reports, 83% of these reports are done by doctors and nurses who are watching this happen, and they think it's related to the vaccine. Otherwise, it wouldn't get reported at the CDC. It's a voluntary system. I've done some of these reports. It takes a half an hour to do a report. And when I go through the pages, it says, warning. Uh, 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 falsification is punishable by uh, federal fines or imprisonment. I mean, I'm going to put my medical license out there for imprisonment. You know, you better believe every single one of these deaths were done by somebody who really, really thinks it's serious because they're putting their medical license on the line. And it's strongly tight, tightly related. So there, now people, there's been outside analysis. McLachlan from London has published an analysis in, in, in an early preprint uh, journal where they reviewed the, the vignettes, what was described, what happened. Since the FDA and CDC had not given us a report on safety, people are starting to get the data and do the analysis themselves. 86% of the deaths had no other explanation outside of the vaccine. Okay, that means people walked into the, they were healthy enough to walk into the vaccine center and they died. Now, when they first rolled out the vaccines, and it was in nursing homes, and people were really sick and, and close to the end of life, there was an analysis from Scandinavia that said maybe only 40% of the, of the shots were really the cause of death. Maybe there are other things that contributed. But here, 86%, there's no other explanation. They got the vaccine, and they died within a very tight temporal relationship. About half the deaths occur within 48 hours, and 80% occur within a week. There's no medical product that has been so tightly related to death than the COVID-19 vaccines. And it's biologically plausible. If a human body is able to take up more of the messenger RNA, the end of DNA, they're able to produce more spike protein. They're not able to clear the genetic material. And this just goes like a freight train. The spike protein itself is lethal. It, it damages organs. It causes blood clots. It causes stroke. There's a massive rise in blood pressure. And the spike protein by design from the gain of function mutation research done in the Wuhan lab is a killer. The spike protein is a killer and it's designed to kill. And in fact, that's what it's doing. Now, you can see the ages, who is dying? We, the CDC should have told this in January, who's dying? We have to wait for McLachlan to tell us in this analysis? You can see, it's the seniors. For some seniors, this stuff is too strong. And the vaccines are very different. Moderna's got 100 micrograms of messenger RNA. Pfizer's got 30 micrograms per shot. That's a giant difference. And then Johnson & Johnson is adenoviral. So you get, you get basically, I think, millions of adenoviral particles. They're very different. Our agency should be telling us which vaccines are safest for seniors. We shouldn't be guessing at this. I get this question all the time. I get this question from my mom. My mom's in a senior home. She wants to know. I have a hard time presenting this data and trying to talk to my mom. And the CDC is not helping us. This report from Rose from Israel, American Journal of Public Health, Health and Law, says for the non-fatal uh, events, the non-fatal events as shown in those colored bars skew towards younger people in largely cardiac, neurologic, immunologic, and hematologic. So people are being injured as the spike protein injures these organs after injection. 
So the evidence-based consulting group in England, which is the lead contract consulting group to the World Health Organization, separately analyzed the yellow card system in the UK, which is similar to the VAERS system. The leaders, Dr. Tess Lowry, she's a very, very well-respected scientist and colleague, they have concluded the vaccines are not safe for human use. Pull them off the market. Okay, pull them. Pull them off the market. That's not me. That's not me. That's the lead consulting group to the World Health Organization. Separately, there is a physician group that has petitioned the US FDA, don't approve these. Separately, there's a nursing group that's petitioned the FDA, don't approve these. Now, for all of you who took the vaccines, and my patients, and my family members, and you got through it, thank the Lord you got through it. Okay, you got through it. And, and if it's given you some immunity, or some protection, wonderful, wonderful. But because you got through it, and it's okay for you, it doesn't mean the next person who takes it isn't gonna be harmed. And that's not right. That's not right. This idea of I took the shot, you just take it. We never put risk on someone else. Whenever we take an injection, the risk is on us and only on us. It's very, very important. The principle of autonomy says no one under any circumstances will have anything forced into their body under any form of pressure, coercion, or threat of reprisal. Pressure means any type of peer pressure from teachers or athletes or schools. Coercion means, listen, you take it or you're gonna lose your job. Threat of reprisal means, if you don't take it, I'm gonna go get you, okay? Never. That's in the Nuremberg Code. That actually comes from Nazi Germany where this was done under Nazi research. And people said, the Nuremberg Code, there are six cornerstones of ethics in research, and they are co coveted by the Office of Human Protection and Research in the United States, the office. We have an office in Washington, they say, it is the cold Z second. First is the Nuremberg Code, second is the Declaration of Hel Helsinki about fair consent, okay? We will never allow those to be railroaded, and people in the UK agree. Now, the CDC, which so far, it looks like it's the only thing that academia is gonna say, we're only gonna listen to the CDC and the National Institutes of Health. Michigan has said that, Michigan State has said that, every medical school in the United States, fine. Let's go to the CDC website together. Barnstable County, Massachusetts, July of 2021. Wait a minute, there's an outbreak. What's wrong with this curve? Two thirds of these people are fully vaccinated. The vaccine's supposed to prevent COVID-19. It looked 90% effective. How in the world can we have an outbreak and have two-thirds of people being fully vaccinated? This is the CDC publication, MMWI. It's their publication. I didn't make this up. Wait a minute, we've got a problem. The virus has mutated, and it's sufficiently mutated through alpha, beta, lam, lam, uh, 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 gamma, and now delta. So as we start vaccinating populations, the, vi the virus, there's always mutants in the background. We used to have 14 or so mutants, different strains, but when we vaccinate, just like we give a single antibiotic, we're gonna raise up a superbug. So the superbug now is Delta. It's responding to vaccination. And obviously the Delta variant can get past the vaccine in great numbers. The Mayo Clinic now in a recent paper, combined with Boston, they've got the protection from Pfizer down to 42%, They've still got Moderna at 76%. I think that's a pretty big difference. Makes sense, Moderna's three times the dose of Pfizer. How come nobody's talking about this? This is from, uh, they have data from uh, 25,000 people in Rochester County, Minnesota. Mayo Clinic is pretty strong in their data. This is a preprint, and our CDC and our NIH or FDA and the media make no mention of it. So if you're gonna consider a vaccine or you're gonna ultimately be mandated to take it, don't you wanna take one that gives you better protection? Less than 50% protection on a vaccine is considered worthless. It would not be approval. The, the Israeli health ministers have the uh, Pfizer vaccine now currently at 17%. And here are the Israeli data. Through the month of March, through the month of July, I'm sorry, They've had fully 15,634 cases. The Israeli peak now is as high as the first peak with no vaccine. Okay, look at that. 86% of cases are fully vaccinated. 
you don't have to be a doctor or an epidemiologist to conclude looking at this table. We've checked, we've checked multiple times with the Israeli uh, ministry and they agree. They estimate Pfizer has 17% protection right now. It's all Delta. The Delta variant is obviously resistant to the, the Pfizer vaccine. It's relatively clear. It's relatively clear. And our CDC director has said this. They've come out and said this. We've had the uh, wedding in Houston. We had the, um, uh, uh, the uh, Democratic lawmaker flight from Texas to uh, Washington. And we had the British cruise vessel where these were isolated populations and they were all fully vaccinated and there was an outbreak. So it's pretty clear the vaccinated are carrying the virus and they can actually spread it to somebody else. And separately, a paper from Lancet from the Tropical Health Division in um, Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam, they just locked down a whole hospital. They had an outbreak of people when they're in lockdown, developed the Delta variant. And the viral load in the vaccinated people was over 250 times that of a regular infection of somebody unvaccinated. It makes sense. The vaccinated now can carry huge amounts of virus in their throat, and that's probably what's fueling our Delta epidemic. We have 48% of people vaccinated, and people, the vaccinated people, must be contributing to the infection. Well, our CDC tells us that's the case. The CDC on July 26 said that through spontaneous reports, this isn't all they have, this is what was pushed up to the CDC. They have 65, 87 hospitalized patients who are fully vaccinated. And look at that second to the last line. 19% died. Last line, I'm sorry. 19% died. So some people said, Dr. McCullough, is there a consolation prize for getting a vaccine? If it doesn't prevent COVID-19, does it at least reduce my chances of dying? I don't think so. 19% is unacceptably high right now. Okay, the current accepted mortality rate in, in a hospital overall for COVID is under 10%. People shouldn't be ripping 19% mortality in a huge sample size like this. The vaccine, and this is Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J mixed together, the vaccines don't stop COVID-19, at least not completely, and they don't, they are not a shield against mortality, and our CDC is telling us, okay, this is very important, the vaccines don't work anymore. The, the virus has mutated, and get past the vaccine. This paper uh, recently published uh, uh, from the Mayo Clinic and a group in Boston, indiscriminate vaccination is reducing the diversity of strains and producing dominant variants. It makes sense if we have a whole bunch of variants and, and we have different, different immunities, we're gonna have a blend of strains. I personally had COVID. I was in a research study, which I was supposed to do. I had the British variant. I knew I had it because it was sequenced. Do you know, do you know where we find the, the, the whole virus in the body, the whole genetic code? GI tract. The Chinese figured that out a long time. They do anal swabs. They don't mess with these PCR stuff. They actually sequence it. So you can do it from anal swabs. So the vaccine is creating a different environment for the virus to start to work its way through populations. And unless the vaccine is sterilizing, unless the vaccine is, is like a bug spray that it's just gonna kill the virus cold, if it allows the virus to kind of live within the vaccinated body, we're in trouble, and it looks like that's the case. So here are the CDC data on the different strains. Now, back in May, as you can see, we started to get, we had the, the British variant, which became dominant. Previous to that, it used to be a nice colored display. We, before vaccination, we used to have a dozen or more strains. And now look what happened with Delta from May all the way through end of um, or through August, August 7th, we're now up to 83% Delta in the United States. Texas Department of Community Health says it's 100%. Any of you have relatives up here in Michigan who get sick with COVID, you can bet your bottom line is Delta. So what does that mean? The original Wuhan spike protein, the spike, the spicule on the spine of the virus, the, uh, the, the ball of the virus is nucleocapsid, the little spokes is a spike protein. That gain of function mutation is interesting. Mother nature is peppering that gain of function and actually putting mutations in it and taking the starch out of that joint. And it's actually making the virus, thank the Lord, less injurious. It is more contagious, it's less injurious. And, and so the other mutations, the British, uh, British variant was like one mutation, uh, gamma was one or two mutations. Delta is minimum seven mutations. Now there's Delta plus, 
which is another mutation, eight, and then in a table from the British, the British are doing the best job. They put out a weekly technical briefing of what's going on, and that's what we should have in the United States. They now have 20 additional mutations within Delta. So it's mutating wildly in order to escape the vaccines. In a paper by Venkata Krishnan, they show it. The, the, the spike protein used to look like this, now it's kind of crumpled like this, and the antibodies just can't grab it. You can't grab it, you can't stop Delta with the vaccines. And so um, you saw these data before about skyrocketing, and these are some uh, leftover slides, but this paper, uh, which I'm an author on, uh, was published in May, and it basically went to all the world governments. We had 57 authors, 17 countries. We said, listen, if you can't get safety under control in May, shut down the program. So there's been a lot of, um, I guess maybe I'm uh, going forward to have some redundancy. Um, but uh, uh, we have a situation where the vaccines don't work and it looks like they're not safe. In fact, people have lost their lives with the vaccine. And the counter argument's been, listen, Dr. McCullough, COVID's a bad illness. 630,000 people lost their lives. And you know what? If some people die with the vaccine, it's a small price to pay. I've heard people say that. My next door neighbor said that. It's interesting, he's Jewish. And I told him, small price to pay for the Aryan race. We never do that. We never sacrifice people like that in such a cold-hearted, cold-blooded way, ever, <laughs> ever. Well, the CDC has been telling us on their website, the CDC is a treasure trove. It's a historical treasure trove, has been telling us since May the vaccines don't work. In May, they had 10,000 vaccine failure cases. They had 10% were hospitalized and 2% died in May. Now, separately, they tell us in July, of those hospitalized, 19% die. So those proportions match up. Do you know during that time period, they didn't have a single failure of natural immunity, not a one. And we have our, our um, Surgeon General, Murthy was on the thing, he goes, oh, vaccine immunity is way better than natural immunity. Fauci has said this, really? Not a single case of natural immunity failing, and yet we have thousands and thousands of cases uh, of failures of vaccine immunity and dying. Okay, I've showed you that. So let's pivot to early treatment. If the vaccines don't work completely, many of you have taken the vaccines, my family has taken them. We thought it was the best thing we did. We tried to make our decisions for our family members and make our own decisions. If they don't work completely, it means you can get COVID. My brother texted me today, he goes, means we're doomed. I said, no man, we're not doomed. We have treatment. In fact, there's a home treatment guide, all the work that we've done. There have been physician organizations that have uh, risen up. Uh, uh, this is probably the most single relied upon slide now in the entire world. Um, it's the basis in, in um, Sri Lanka and Thailand and Malaysia and East Asia and South Africa and the United States and elsewhere. This is called sequence multi-drug therapy when someone does get COVID-19. I'll walk through it. If, you're, you, if you get COVID-19, get it home, quarantine, do your contract tracing, ventilate your house, open the windows, Open the windows. The virus hates fresh air. Do you know, in Singapore, they did studies. If you're outside, you, it's impossible to transmit the virus. But get in a close room, and you know, you have to be in a close room with somebody for about three hours to transmit the virus. It's not a little thing like this. It's three hours. So 85% of transmission occurs in the home. Why? Because people spend more than three hours together in the home. It's the only place that you do it. Now, age under 50, a helpful nutraceutical bundle. The nutraceuticals, the vitamins, they don't save patients, but all the studies show if you're a little bit deficient in these, the risks are higher. Vitamin D deficiency, the mortality skyrockets. Zinc deficiency. People on diuretics, for instance, uh, water pills, they get zinc deficient. So it, it's one of these things where we can't prove the vitamins are helpful, but all the data suggests they're supportive, and why not? They're cheap. So nutraceutical bundle, under age 50, finish your quarantine, and then you're done. You're done. You can go back to work and enjoy life, go back to school. But if you're under age 50 and s symptoms get worse, and this is important for kids, people say, what about kids? The only people being hospitalized in the United States are getting no treatment at home, zero. 
if you look at the papers of people hospitalized and look down the table of baseline characteristics, what treatment do they get? The answer is nothing. The answer is nothing. Treat the illness early at home. If a child develops severe symptoms, we move over to the middle category. Now, the middle category for adults and seniors, we now can use a monoclonal antibody as shown here in gray. That we, the current one is called Regeneron. And if you've been vaccinated or not, if you're over 65 and you start having severe symptoms, call your doctor and demand an antibody infusion and figure out where these damn antibodies are. The United States pre-purchased 500 million doses of these. Where are they? How many does University of Michigan have? How much does Bowman have? How about Providence? What about McLaren? Right? Come on. Where are these monoclonal antibodies? Where are the public service announcements to show where these monoclonal antibodies are? Seniors should be demanding these. President Trump got COVID-19. What's the first thing they did? Monoclonal antibodies. He was there. He took some, you know, he's all bluster. He took, I beat COVID-19. Well, of course he did. I just got a phone call on the way here informing me that um, Greg Abbott, governor of Texas has got COVID after he's fully vaccinated. He just got a monoclonal antibody infusion. Terrific. I was on the phone with the DeSantis, we're on WebEx with DeSantis' group in Florida. I said, get these monoclonal antibodies out so seniors can use them. 80% of them are going unused on the shelf because of this mentality of not treating COVID. You go into a sterile room off the ER, get the infusion and go home. You can do that in urgent care center, you can do that in nursing home. Demand monoclonal antibodies, but that's not all. After that, we use what's called anti-infective intracellular uh, agents. We can use hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine to this day is the most widely used drug to treat COVID-19. It is supported by 250 studies. The, F the NIH gave up on it back in June. The FDA, uh, uh, shortly after that, after a fake paper in Lancet, FDA made a blanket statement, don't use hydroxychloroquine. They never updated their statement. In a year that's gone by, there have been hundreds of studies showing hydroxychloroquine is beneficial. Hundreds. Randomized trials as outpatients, large observational studies. The only studies that don't show hydroxychloroquine has a big effect is when it's late and they're on a mechanical ventilator. It makes sense. It's too late to have an antiviral make a difference. And by the way, remdesivir doesn't work there either. So, you know, if someone says, listen, we don't want to give it to them, they're on the ventilator, I'd say, fine. The studies are small, but they don't show a benefit. But all the early treatment studies of hydroxychloroquine show it works. Or we can use ivermectin. Ivermectin is another drug that works in, inside the cell, impairs the nuclear entry of the virus, 60 supportive studies. We add doxycycline or zithromycin, you've all, all taken all this, because there is a bronchitis or a sinusitis component to it due to bacteria. Uh, importantly, after that, we use uh, steroids. We can use inhaled budesonide, which we should do. Inhaled budesonide, a pulmocort inhaler, any doctor can prescribe that. Pulmocort inhaler in load reduces the risk of hospitalization with COVID-19 by 87%, shown in two randomized trials. Two randomized trials. We have uh, tw uh, 12 randomized trials with oral steroids. Now, they're used in the hospital, but I've always said, listen, I don't care if the patient's physically in the hospital or at home, use the principle. I'm not going to wait for the hospital to start steroids. That's ridiculous. I refuse to do that. In Brazil, they don't do it. Other, other cities, I will use prednisone, readily available. Probably half the people in the room is taking prednisone. Yeah, it's cheap, and we use it on day five for pulmonary symptoms for about five days. And colchicine, that's a, an anti-inflammatory drug. It's a drug that's um, uh, used to treat gout. The Canadians did a large, randomized, prospective, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial, over 4,000 patients over 30 days and there was a dramatic reduction in hospitalization and death. So what I've done in the protocol is I've taken things that show a signal of benefit, not relying on a single drug, but putting them into combination to treat this. And then lastly, we address the issue of blood clots. It's very important. And a paper from UCLA shows that the blood clotting system is revved up, particularly the platelets are revved up a thousand fold. That means a baby aspirin is not gonna work. A baby aspirin works for heart disease because the platelets are not that revved up. But in COVID, which actually makes the blood system go wild, we need full-dose aspirin. It's one of the few times, full-dose aspirin, no questions asked. Japanese do it for 90 days to reduce these late risk of stroke or, uh, or heart attack. I personally have some blockages. Personally, I do. I took it for 90 days, no questions. I was not gonna end up with a heart attack or stroke. After that, we use blood thinners. And if I get a high-risk senior, my patients have pacemakers, they have uh, 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 blockages, stents. I am not fooling around with that. Anybody with a blood clotting disorder like factor V Leiden or what have you, Lovenox, full dose, 
Not half dose, nothing, full dose. My dad got COVID in a nursing home. I had them put on Lovenox for a month. I was not going to have dad get hit with a blood clot on week three. That's how people die. I just lost a patient last night, a 39-year-old guy in the ICU. And what happened is blood clots, overwhelming. And it's the saddest thing. Him and his wife got sick together about two weeks ago. The father's a pastor. Father reached out to me. I was helped coordinate in Fort Worth. The mother takes the monoclonal antibodies. She gets in the sequence drug program. He's a big guy. He's 39. He's going to be okay, but he's a big guy. He delays treatment. He gets worse and worse and worse. Now we're behind, and we start the drugs late. He gets one or two doses of drugs at home. He crashes in the hospital. He's in the hospital. He's, he's on oxygen. Last night, 10 o'clock, phone call, cardiac arrest, follow-up phone call, dead. 39 years old. It can happen. That's Delta variant. It can happen. Easy to treat early can be fatal in the hospital. And we're going to have more deaths if these patients are not treated. That's the reason why this algorithm is so important. So we use the drugs in combinations. The doctors have to decide. We can even use oxygen concentrators at home. We have pulse oxes. Patients wear pulse oximeters at home. We like to see the oxygen saturation more than 92%, but we know with COVID, it's micro blood clots in the lungs that reduces the oxygenation. When the CT scan shows COVID pneumonia, that's actually COVID blood clots. And the biggest mistake is to say, oh, we're going to clear that up with some remdesivir. No. Remdesivir, try it, but put people on blood thinners. Blood thinners is what saves people. And we don't have time for the large randomized trials. There's several inpatient supportive analysis for full-dose aspirin and full-dose anticoagulation, demand it in high-risk seniors. I have a young gal who's an officer at our church. I go to Methodist Church in Dallas. On the way here, I mean, my phone, this is, this is my life now. She is about 40. She's a little delayed on treatment, a little delayed in recognition. Her oxygen saturations are in the 80s. She goes, I'm going to the ER. I said, fine, demand a monoclonal antibody and get those Lovenox injections. Go home. There's no advantage to being in the hospital, honestly, unless patients need a lot of oxygen or the mechanical ventilator. I'd rather treat them at home. It's just we can do better. We have better control. In the hospital, you lose control. Do you know the families, you can't visit your family members. How many of you have had a family member in the hospital? Yeah, you know how hard that is. There's no more talking. You can't talk to the doctors on rounds. You can't figure out what's going on. There's no, there's no negotiation. So we can go with a phone call under uh, President Trump. We can actually get an oxygen concentrator at home. You can order one on Amazon for about 900 bucks. It pulls oxygen out of the air and concentrates it. People who get this in the lungs, I had it. It got in my lungs. I know what I'm talking about. You need help for about a month. It's a long illness, but we can get through it. So importantly, this has taken off. And I mentioned we have organizations around the world. These are some colleagues in Italy. Terapia domiciliary COVID-19. They use drugs in combination. They use the protocols that we worked on together. Look at the celebration. They filled up entire plazas in Italy, and they basically said, we can get down to zero hospitalizations. In some major centers in Italy now, which got absolutely slaughtered with COVID-19, they have zero hospitalizations. They still have COVID, but they're treating it at home using the sequence multi-drug approach. I wish we would have had billions of dollars to invest in randomized trials. I would like, I'd like half a billion. I could have led those trials. <laughs> I, I can do as, I can do as anybody. I can put on my University of Michigan tie and say, listen, I can do it. No problem doing it. Nobody invested in the clinical trials. This was a time for doctors to use their judgment and win the game. And I'm telling you, the drugs in combination win the game. We have data to support it. This is one of the analysis from one of the leading centers in Dallas. By instituting early treatment, and this was an early protocol, it didn't have a lot of the bells and whistles, we can reduce the risk of hospitalization and death by about 85% compared to expected values or values from a reference group in surrounding counties, which is what we did in this analysis. Early treatment is what decides a severe case or not. Demand it. And you should call your doctor right now and say, listen, are you ready to treat me? And if you're not, you know what? Go to a telemedicine service, because I basically, I went nuts. When I testified in the U.S. Senate on November 19th, and we had the follow-up on December 8th, those were historic Senate testimonies. They will go down in history. Pierre Corey led the second one. Pierre showed up in the Senate with his lab coat on, and he went absolutely nuts. He said, we are having Americans die with no treatment. Die. And he goes, it won't happen on my watch. And he was right. He was right. We should have always done this. We estimate today, out of 640,000 Americans who died, 85% of them died needlessly. They were denied early treatment. We couldn't save them all, 
but we could have made a huge impact. Paul Alexander in our group has shown in nursing home studies, in the nursing home, if we do anything, any one of these early interventions in the nursing home, if we would have given a little bit of hydroxychloroquine or steroids or anticoagulants or just a little something, you can knock down mortality by 60%. The only reason why the nursing home patients died is nobody did anything for them. Nobody did anything for them. They sat in the nursing homes for weeks sick and then they got shipped to the hospital. Or if they got shipped to the hospital early, nothing happened until they needed oxygen. They should have started something, do something early in the nursing home and all the nursing home intervention studies are dramatically positive. Why am I the only person who's ever brought this to you? Why weren't you updated weekly? Why weren't you updated weekly by our CDC and our National Institutes of Health? And how about the local news? Didn't anybody even ask a question? When was the last time the local news gave you an update on early treatment? Zero. It doesn't even come into their mind. I'll never forget, Elizabeth Warren gave this tear-jerking uh, uh, um, uh, presentation of her brother dying about her age. Didn't, uh, didn't occur to her that maybe if he was treated, he would be alive today? It's not even coming into people's minds. People are in a trance right now. They are in a trance. I'm gonna get COVID, I'm gonna die. That's all I can think of. Wear a mask, give me a vaccine. It is, people are in a trance. It is a treatable illness. All the data suggests it's treatable. It's not a single drug, it's not perfect. I wish it was, but we can use drugs in combination. So I wanna finish and conclude by saying, COVID-19 pandemic is a global disaster and it keeps going. It's a gift that keeps giving. Unfortunately, the vaccine program is making it worse. The pathophysiology is complex. It's not amendable to a single drug. Despite trying to wear masks and control the contagion, there's two poor outcomes, hospitalization and death. I think we're gonna have to uh, agree that, that we are gonna get COVID. Most of us are gonna get COVID. As long as we don't end up in the hospital or die, we can get through this. Natural immunity appears to be the um, savior. And in fact, thanks to Senator, I have my natural immunity wristband. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to have natural immunity. I have, as a doctor, I'm telling you, I've, I'm naturally immune. I've come face to face with one of these right in my face from a COVID-19 patient. Nothing. Nothing. Okay, I'm telling you, you don't have to be scared. You don't have to be scared. This is really important. This is a joyous message. You don't have to be scared. I did something for the Better Business Bureau in Dallas and all these, all these small business owners. They said, doctor, should we have a vaccine mandate? I said, listen, if you're gonna do anything, figure out who your COVID recovered people are and make sure your shifts, you have enough people on your shifts to make sure you have enough naturally immune people to carry out your small business. I've had teleconferences with the military. I said, do an inventory of who's naturally immune. That's who you wanna know. If you're gonna go on a mission, you're gonna put a bunch of people on a boat or a tank, figure out who's naturally immune. Do you know the CDC, when they conduct the vaccine program, they never ask if someone's naturally immune or not. They never ask if they had COVID-19. When you fill out the safety form when something bad happens, they don't ask if they have COVID-19. There's a belief, by the way, that all vaccinating on top of the infection, which you don't need to need the vaccine, that that's actually causing all the problems. And it turns out about 25 to 30% of people taking the vaccine didn't need it. They're naturally immune. They've already had COVID-19. The hospitalization rate uh, and death rates are still unacceptably high. Early ambulatory therapy with a sequence multidrug approach is the best we can do at this point in time. There is no mention of this ever by our public health officials. And the same is true, by the way, in the EU and in Britain and in, by the way, in Italy. That group I showed you in Italy, they're like a, they're a, um, a, a rebel doctor group that's breaking through. So it's the Rebel Doctors, Association of American Physicians and Surgeons, the Truth for Health Foundation, the Frontline Critical Care Consortium, American Frontline Doctors. These organizations formed because of a failure of our public health response. We had to do something. When I testified in the Senate, I told the Senate, I told America, I said, I can't, I don't have it in my, my ethical or moral DNA to have the virus slaughter in one of my patients. I can't do it. I can't do it. The virus was not gonna slaughter my father and the virus wasn't gonna slaughter one of my patients. And the doctors, including probably the rank and file of every doctor in the state outside of maybe about 10, have let the virus slaughter their patients. 
and they, at some point in time, are going to have to come out of their trance. And people say, oh, Dr. McCullough, aren't you worried? Aren't you worried? What, what do your colleagues say to you? I said, they can't look me in the eye. They can't look me in the eye. It's a walk of shame. What the hell? They can't prescribe prednisone, budesonide, lofenix? They do that all day long for their other patients, and suddenly COVID, they can't do that? Do you know when these poor, sick patients, when their families go to the pharmacy to get their drugs, you know what the pharmacies do? They say, is this for COVID? The patients say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get it for my, my mom who's got COVID. Sorry, let me call the doctor and double check a dose. They do this little routine. Oh, I can't get a hold of the doctor. Sorry, I can't give you your medicines. Since when? Since when? Do they do that for asthma? How about emphysema? How about diabetes? No, the medicines are flowing at the pharmacy. But suddenly for COVID, nothing is given to patients. No, let them suffer. Let them suffer. It's in the minds of people. These are not bad people. They're not bad people, but their eyes are clouded and their hearts are hardened right now. And whatever's going on is going on everywhere in the world. It's not just here in Michigan or the United States. It's in the minds of people right now. And the tiniest islands in East Asia, the deepest places in the forest. I've done some stuff on the internet. I've had people contact me from Africa saying, Dr. McCullough, we, we can save these patients. But other doctors say, no, don't treat them. Yeah, I, got, I, I, wanted, I, I got this stress call from Indonesia. They had these little Indonesian guys, they had them on their knees and they, and they were putting their knee in the back of their, they vaccinating them. They don't vaccinate them, they're cutting them off everything, cutting off their, their social security, their health care, what have you. It's in the minds of people now. Their eyes are clouded, their hearts are hardened, and people are doing bad things to other people. And it's in the context of this virus, the respiratory illness, and it's the, in the context of the vaccine. The vaccine is not a happy thing either. The vaccine now has, in a sense, become a menace over us. Right, people, half the nation is about ready to lose their job in the next two months, including me. Since when? Really, a vaccine is gonna make us lose our jobs? A vaccine that doesn't work? A vaccine that's obviously not safe? And it's, what's in the minds of people right now? There's families that won't see other family members because they won't take the vaccine. They're, in the US military, they're talking about by force, other guys wrestling down other guys and jabbing them into them. Things are getting disturbingly out of control and it's in the context of the virus. You're a group of faith, your faith leaders will help you try to interpret what's going on. But it is clear, as I started out, we are in a very special time in mankind, in the history of mankind. Whatever's going on, it is the entire world is involved in this. Every human being in the world, it appears to have a program. The program is everything I've talked about tonight is happening to promote as much fear, isolation, suffering, hospitalization, and death in order to get a needle in every arm at all costs. That is what's going on. And no one in this room can disagree. There is no group that may be skip spared from a needle in every arm, and you know that. There's no exemptions. There's no recognition of natural immunity. There's no, if you, you know, we're gonna die of an allergy, sorry, take the vaccine. If you die, too bad. Listen, there's 200 nurses down at Houston Methodist Hospital. They can't take the vaccine. They've had near-fatal allergic reactions. They've documented this. They're pregnant, they've got blood clotting disorders. They have hardcore reasons not to take the vaccine. Houston Methodist said, fire them. Fire them. Take the vaccine. The military saying, get on your knees and take the vaccine. This isn't stopping until people somehow come out of their trance. My single most important phone calls I have right now is with psychologists. I am talking to psychologists about how do we deal with a mass psychosis? We're in a mass psychosis. The whole world is in a trance where most of them, it's very cloudy to them. They actually just, they say the vaccine's good. 
We say, it doesn't work, and it looks, there's thousands of people die. They'll say, well, where do I take the vaccine? It's just, it's not computing to them. It's not computing to the administrators. And there's, there's almost, a, there's almost a, a, a punitive nature to this. Do you know there's some colleges, that about 9% of colleges have chosen vaccine mandates. Do you know that um, some colleges, most colleges, by the way, don't have a policy, which is wrong to begin with. Um, you know, the CDC has said it's illegal to, to impose a mandate on an investigational vaccine. There's actually laws that say this. The courts are saying, we don't care. We don't even care about laws. Because the courts, the judges, their eyes are clouded and their hearts are hardened. There's no justice. Oh, we're going to file a lawsuit. It's like, why? Why? There, there's a lawsuit to shut down the program right now at 45,000 deaths that's estimated out of CMS. The courts are saying, well, just vaccinate them. The only thing, if there's no justice, if there's no, um, if there's no ability to have a rapid awakening of what's going on, the only thing left is to be unbreakable. For you to be unbreakable. Every one of you to be unbreakable. Whether you took the vaccine or not, for you to be unbreakable, for you to understand something deeply has been going on wrong in the world. It's easily been going on for 18 months. There are data suggesting this may have been going on for years, okay? But there's something wrong, and now's the time to be unbreakable. People say, Dr. McCullough, are you going to take the vaccine? Or people say, listen, I, I don't want to take the vaccine, but if I have to take one, which one can I take? You know, talk about moral hazard. I did something on the radio with Hugh Hewitt. Anybody know who Hugh Hewitt is? Okay, Hugh Hewitt. He decided he was going to go after me. And Hugh Hewitt, he told me he's a lawyer. He, he made sure that on radio he's a lawyer. And he started asking me, and I, I gave him my views on this. And he goes, well, don't you think this is controversial? I said, no, I'm just citing the data. You, you decide if it's controversial. Then he kept pursuing. He goes, he like, now he's trying to turn into a prosecutor. And finally he said, Dr. McCullough, what do you think? If someone of my listener listens to, you, listens to you and they don't take the vaccine and they die of COVID, isn't that on your shoulders, Dr. McCullough? And he, he, I, if I could have seen him, I bet he rested his case. And I said, you know what? You bring up the issue of moral hazard. And moral hazard means that you advise something to, on somebody and you take on the moral responsibility for that. And I said, listen, if someone didn't take the vaccine, that's the way it would have been 10 months ago. We didn't have the vaccines. And if we didn't have vaccines, you know what? People get sick with COVID-19. We treat them with drugs and we save their lives. And you know, if someone has taken the vaccine and they get sick, I treat them the same way because they're pouring in. They've taken the vaccine. They're getting sick anyway. So for me, the moral hazard is not, is not about deferring the vaccine. The moral hazard is about telling somebody to take the vaccine. And I can tell you what's going to happen. Half the population doesn't want it. They're, they're talking to each other. They know what's happened. There's an internet survey where they ask people, do you know anybody who's died of the vaccine? 12% of people know in their circle or in their circles, they know somebody died of the vaccine. That's a lot. People talk. In big churches, one or two people died of the vaccine. My mom's in a nursing home. My dad's had COVID-19. He recovered. He's not going to take the vaccine. He's not mentally capable to make that decision, but my mom is. And my mom is, oh, she's watching all this and she's studying like so many other people her age. They get together and they, and they, they probably take three hours at dinner and they're going to discuss this. And she's not sure. And every so often, and, and she'd tell me, she goes, they, come by, they came by again and asked me about the vaccine. I said, I don't want it. I don't do good with flu shots. My mom exaggerates everything, right? I don't do good. I'm going to have an allergic reaction. I said, okay, mom, you know, we can treat you if you get COVID-19. Okay, going along. And then one day in June, I said, Mom, I said, are they still coming by with about you and the vaccine? Oh, no, no, they dropped it. They don't come by anymore and push the vaccine. I said, why? They go, oh, they had somebody die on the other side right after the vaccine. <laughs> Listen, from the CMS data, we think 45,000 Americans have died after the vaccine. Half of them die within 48 hours, 80% within a week. You know most of them are seniors. COVID-19 preyed on the seniors. The vaccine is preying on the seniors with respect to the immediate risk of death. This is not a joke. 
This is not a joke. The non-fatal injuries are going on the young people. On the way here, I sat next to a wonderful kind of pharmaceutical representative person who, as you know, if any of you are pharmaceutical representatives, they tend to be these incredibly uh, personable people. And she immediately engaged, are you a doctor? And you know, this whole thing. And so, yes, I'm a doctor. And we started talking. And, and we started talking about the vaccine. She goes, well, I took the vaccine, and my husband took the vaccine. Their son actually plays for the Buffalo Bills, so they're in Chicago for the game. A really, really cool couple. Uh, anyhow, they talked about the vaccine, and she goes, but you know, I'm really, I'm really having worries because my son, who's at the University of Texas, he took the vaccine. He's only 22 years old. He was in the hospital for two days afterwards, so obviously he was one of the hundreds of thousands of Americans that end up in the hospital. A 22-year-old kid should not be in the hospital for anything. When I was 22 years old, I was having a grand old time. I was not in the hospital, okay? So the bottom line is, he was in the hospital for two days. I said, what happened? She goes, well, we were away, and we don't know. We didn't really get a clear story, but we understand he's pretty sick, and now he has relentless headaches, relentless. He goes, we think he's gonna have to drop out of school. He have to drop out of school. And this is what's been described. There have been thousands of people that have these relentless neurologic syndromes, paralysis, twitching, um, I've had a couple of patients like this. They can't walk straight anymore. One of my friends who took the vaccine early on, we had dinner with him the other night, and his head was going like this. I, finally, I said, Terry, when did that start? He goes, well, about two months after Moderna. An interventional cardiologist, Cedar Sinai, a friend of mine, former co-editor with me, Norm Lepore. Norm has got now incessant ringing in the ears, tinnitus. It is relentless, relentless, relentless. I can't sleep. When the the products get in the brain and the tissues, the myocarditis, the neurologic syndrome. Fortunately, for 168 million Americans, it didn't happen. You took the shot, you digested the stuff, it got out of your body, thank the Lord. But so for some unlucky people, it went everywhere in the body, and that spike protein damaged the organs. It's happened in 545,000 American people in total. That's what the CDC has certified. That's a medium-sized city. We are gonna have, and, and it's just gonna blossom, if we force the vaccine on the rest of the population, you're gonna see neurology clinics and internal medicine clinics are gonna be overwhelmed with people. I've already seen it, I've already seen this myocarditis, the kids don't need the vaccine because it's so mild, they get over it, it's like a cold, most kids don't even know they have COVID. I've already seen this myocarditis, and the CDC, when it had uh, 200 cases, the CDC said 90% of these people, kids were in the hospital. You know what it takes to hospitalize an 18-year-old kid? The 90% were in the hospital. Um, they had uh, marked EKG changes, positive troponin, signs or symptoms of heart failure. I've seen these people in my country. And I have college kids on heart failure medicines. They're trying to start their college career and they're on heart failure medicines. I can't get the myocarditis to stop. And there's no guidance. It's not like the CDC and the, and the NIH said, doctors, listen, when the, it can, the FDA said myocarditis can occur. Today, Moderna, more myocarditis risk. It can occur. Doctors, this is what you should do. We're given no guidance. There's no playbook on how to handle these vaccine injury syndromes. So I'm trying everything I can. I can't stop the myocarditis from stopping. So these troponins, typical heart attack, troponin goes from negligible to one or two and goes down. This kid's troponin is 50. His heart is rotting out in front of my very eyes. I'm telling you, I don't want to scare you away from the vaccine, but I am scared of this. I've seen enough firsthand to make me realize, wait a minute, we've got to, we've got to slow down here and figure this out. So I'll let those be the last words and we can move into the next part of the, the session. Thank you so much. So tomorrow afternoon, thank you, uh, Dr. McCullough. Tomorrow afternoon, from 2.30 to 4 o'clock, will be a panel discussion. It will look at a variety of things. Uh, we will be asking questions tonight. Uh, there will be, we will not be having a forum for questions, but we have a long list of questions. We're going to cover a variety of topics. Of course, the weekend is going to address other early treatment options. It's also going to deal with exemption and other legal issues relative 
uh, to the current environment we're in. We're going to take a, I think we're going to do this as quickly as possible. We're going to take a five minute break. If you need to stretch, go to the restroom. Uh, please go ahead and do that. And then we will have a liberty and uh, health uh, engagement here with the Liberty and Health Foundation Alliance. So take five minutes or so. And there are restrooms to the left out through the connecting corridor. There are restrooms in the back. And we will be back uh, for our next panel discussion.
testing. Okay, folks, we'd like to invite you to turn to your seats. We're going to continue the program. If you can find a, a seat, and we will give the Liberty and Health Alliance an opportunity to share as we continue in our weekend. Thank you so much. Appreciate your cooperation. The Sabbath is, is here, and I'd like to ask a special blessing as we enter into these sacred hours. Our pursuit is truth. Our venue is an opportunity for dialogue, and uh, our belief is in your right to choose. We're about to have a panel discussion with the Liberty and Health Alliance that Dr. Conrad Vine will moderate tomorrow morning at 8.30. Our first service will begin. We'll have a special Sabbath school with uh, Bruce Cameron, special attorney, attorney in employment law, and then Dr. Roger Schwelt on all the natural things that can be done to combat COVID-19. And then we will have a second service. There'll be a lunch. If you are from out of town, we'd like for you to join that. If you're from local, we'd encourage you to either bring your own food and enjoy the tents or slip home or go to one of our area parks. And then at 2.30, we will have a panel where questions will be asked of a wide spectrum of physicians that I will moderate. And then we will enjoy a presentation by Matt Staver from the Liberty Council. Uh, again, another perspective on legal um, rights, privileges, and exemptions. And then we will end our afternoon with a presentation from Ron Knott. So we hope you'll be praying through these things in humility, uh, listening, and of course, as we've heard tonight, exercising your agency as a human being. So let's pray. Lord, we are thankful for a sanctuary in time. And as the Sabbath has come to us now, we are praying that Sabbath rest would fill our souls. And we're asking, Lord, that your spirit would be here where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And now we're asking, Lord, that you'll guard these hours and that we will honor you and that our fellowship would strengthen and comfort. So we put our lives in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Conrad Vine and the Liberty and Health Alliance. Uh, good evening, everybody, and it's a privilege to be sharing in this evening with you here tonight. And for those of you watching online, we give you a warm welcome to the next segment of our COVID Conscience and uh, Courage Weekend. We have on the platform uh, together with me three um, brothers and sisters in ministry who have established just recently the Liberty and Health Alliance. Uh, opposite me, we have Dr. Leela Lewis. Uh, Dr. Lewis is an MD. She is an OBGYN, a specialist in Gilbert, Arizona, and she has over 20 years of experience in the medical field. Uh, Dr. Lewis graduated from Loma Linda University Medical School uh, in 2001, and she's affiliated with medical facilities Chandler Regional Medical Center and the Mercy Gilbert Medical Center, and we're delighted you're sharing this evening with us tonight, Dr. Leela Lewis. Uh, next to you, we have uh, Brother Scott Ritzmer. <clears throat> Scott is an author, a speaker, and a former educator. He graduated from Calvin College in 2003 with a BA in secondary education and U.S. history, 
followed by an MA in History, Political Science, and Economics in 2007 from Cal State San Bernardino. He is currently the Speaker Director for Belt of Truth Ministries, presenting seminars around our nation on media use, true education, current events, and prophetic interpretation. He is a co-founder and vice president of the Liberty and Health Alliance, which was born in 2021 to promote the health message and address the crisis over conscience that our world is facing today and that many of us here tonight are wrestling with right now. He enjoys country living with his wife and his three kids in Lakeview, Michigan. Welcome, Brother Scott. And sitting immediately to my right here, it's my privilege to welcome uh, Brother Jonathan Zirkel, JD. He is an attorney from Loma Linda, California, and he is the Vice President for Legal Affairs for the Liberty and Health Alliance. Jonathan Zirkel started his career as a prosecutor, so be careful what you say, with the San Bernardino DA's office, then spent 10 years representing the Department of Veteran Affairs in employment law trials and other healthcare matters, and now he specializes in private practice on nonprofit law, federal employment law, and religious liberty. He's a former director of Advent Hope in Loma Linda and the president of Word Radio, FM 107.3, an Adventist radio station transmitting from Ukaipa, California. Welcome, Brother Jonathan. So, Dr. Lee, we've spoken a few times on the phone since we first connected about this program here. Uh, could you just share with us what was the original vision and, and purpose the, um, for the Health and Liberty Alliance? Well, it all started for me over a year ago. Actually, it's been a little over a year ago. I had the opportunity of being the medical director for Adventist World Radio. We had a show. We were doing weekly shows on COVID. And right from the beginning, I realized, you know, God gave us a health message, and I think we need to be focusing on that. Dr. McCullough did such a beautiful job of pointing out that there's a lot more than hand sanitizer, social distancing, and masks, and so we kind of embarked on that endeavor. Well, come November, December, around the time when the vaccines were starting to be given for those of us who were front line, I, of course, was front line. I'm an obstetrician. I do labor, so basically I'm an ER doctor for pregnant women. And I began to ask questions of my colleagues. Well, you know, this vaccine, many of the things that Dr. McCullough brought up, it's mRNA or DNA, what, what if it stays, what if it doesn't stay local? What if it gets taken up by the serologic system? What if the spike protein gets deposited in certain organs and what's gonna be the long-term ramifications of that? And the answers that I were give, was given were very surprising actually. Um, it was essentially just take the vaccine and don't ask any questions. And, and I was very shocked by that because, of course, in medicine, we're taught to ask questions. And so I went through November, December, come January. I was pleading with the Lord. I didn't want to be presumptuous on either side of the stick. I didn't want to, you know, obviously I'm exposed on a day-to-day basis to COVID. I didn't want to get COVID and be like, oh, the Lord's going to protect me because the Lord expects us to use the science that he's given us. And at the same time, I didn't want to take the vaccine and potentially bring harm because I believe my body was the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so I pled with God, and this is my personal testimony. This is not what I'm saying that the Lord is telling you, but I can guarantee you one thing. If you ask the Lord what he wants you to do, and you're earnest and sincere about that, God will tell you what he wants you to do. And so I fasted and prayed. I was very intent about this. I fasted and prayed for three days after reaching out to all of my fellow lifestyle colleagues, and I felt like I wasn't getting an answer that, um, that I felt like was necessarily coming from the Lord. And so after three days of fasting, I was scheduled that afternoon for my Pfizer vaccine. I came home from call. I was on the phone with a couple of my very good friends. We were praying together. And the husband of the couple said, you know, I'm going to pray something. And he said, Lord, he said, if you don't want Leela to get this vaccine, have something so crazy happen that she will have no question that you didn't want her to get this shot. 
And I was like, okay, great, thanks for praying that, because sometimes when I prayed those things, some really weird things happen. <laughs> anyway, long story short, this was at 9 o'clock in the morning. I was completely fine at 9 a.m. By 10.30 in the morning, an hour and a half later, I was flat on my back upstairs with 103 temperature. I couldn't get up. I was sick as a dog. I started getting pleuritic chest pain. For those of you physicians and medical professionals in the audience, I thought I had COVID. Uh, by that afternoon, I was in urgent care, and I was transported to the ER. Well, long story short, it wasn't COVID. Subsequently, I got COVID. Don't worry. Now I have natural immunity, praise God. But at that time, <laughs> at that time, I was um, actually, it was, it was strep throat of all the weirdest, strangest things. And for me, God had said right then and there, no, Leela, I don't want you to get this vaccine. And so there was another incident similar to that. And I began, after, after God told me twice, it took me two times for me to really realize God didn't want me to get this, I started researching, heavily researching. And I began to, again, call all of my colleagues and say, have you seen this article? Have you seen this? Finally, I was, someone actually asked me if I should just become a Christian scientist or Jehovah's Witness if I continued on this course. Well, praise the Lord, God put me in contact with now my good, wonderful friend and mentor, Dr. McCullough. And I all of a sudden realized that there were more of us out there. And I began to plead with God because I began to see that there was a need for Seventh-day Adventist Christians to stand at a time when I believe, I believe, that God gave us a message of health, a holistic message of health. And what a time and an opportunity to begin to share that. And so the Lord put our little team together around this time. And from then on, our purpose became to provide and inspire people that we have liberty of conscience. We have the right to choose what we put into our bodies. And that's how Liberty and, Con uh, and Health Alliance developed. That's a fascinating testimony, Dr. Lewis. <clears throat> We're sure glad you didn't go down with strep throat last night or this morning before you came here. Uh, so, Brother Scott, uh, you, you, came in, you uh, became involved with this. What led you to become involved with Liberty and Health Alliance? I've always had a passion for religious liberty, for liberty of conscience. In fact, um, what drew me into the Seventh-day Adventist movement, this is going back 10 or 12 years when I first came into the movement of, of seeing prophecy um, of being fulfilled in our time and in the future, in the near future. Um, at that time, it was really a picture of God's character that was captivating my heart. And I saw a different view of God in Adventism than I had seen in the churches that I grew up in. And so coming in, I was very, very much wanting to um, have that be a part of my experience of understanding God is not a God of force. And he is, if you look at prophecy, you see the beast, you see the lamb. In fact, the first sermon I ever heard in a Seventh-day Adventist church that I ended up subsequently coming in through was making that contrast. And I was already on board with that, writing a book at the time, actually, about the coercive nature of the powers of this age. And so that was part of my social sciences background and really believing in that. And then when I heard, wow, these guys are preaching this, this is one of their doctrines, that got me really excited. So just a little background, I can't give you my whole testimony, obviously, but I've always had my ear to the ground when it comes to issues of conscience, when it comes to issues of coercion. And when I start hearing the, the, the whispers last year about the vaccine rollout and mandates, the antenna go up and you start saying, okay, we know Revelation 13 is coming and there will be elements in that time of coercion, of, 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 of mandates of certain things, and you're not allowed to choose. And so are there preparatory stages that are leading into that where you see the, the trial balloon, you see the, you see the scaffolding for that type of prophetic fulfillment being built now? And so as you see that speaking like a dragon, so to speak, uh, trying it on for size right now, that got my attention from a prophetic standpoint and really just that central core issue of, of what God is like and how do we reflect that to the world? Because when we share the message of liberty of conscience, we're actually telling people about God. We're telling people about a great story called the great controversy and where we're going in the future and how you can be ready for that. And so when we say speak like a dragon, you know, Satan's methods are coercive power. Jesus' methods are invitation. 
Come, come ye who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's choose ye this day whom ye shall serve. And we can draw that distinction in our doctrine, in our preaching, and also in our advocacy to help people. So that was the liberty side, where can we actually help people who are, who are undergoing persecution now? And then the health side, I mean, the, the, the health message is the right arm of the third angel's message. So both of these are elements very much of our prophetic identity and mission. And so, you know, I was thinking about the health issue. I saw a study out of the British Medical Journal that 73% reduction in your chances for moderate to, to severe COVID if you're on a whole food plant-based diet or just a plant-based diet. And then you add vitamin D on top of that and you add exercise on top of that. And it's like, man, we really have a message that is of urgency for our world right now. In fact, it's been of urgency for years. You have double the amount of people that died of COVID last year die of heart disease every single year. And how many would that be if all those people were persuaded and invited and found the joy, literally you are happier when you're on a plant-based diet, um, found the joy of, of living and, and not being uh, suffering from these lifestyle-related diseases. We know COVID very much was a, a, a pandemic of vulnerability in terms of who it was afflicting in the highest rates. Um, even, even people like Bill Maher are talking about this, like the, the stones are crying out when I hear him preaching the health message. So maybe we can do that and uh, le leave it to God's people to be the head, not the tail. So that kind of brought me into this and um, privileged to work with these, these colleagues over the last couple of months. But, you know, it's been building for many years because I love the truth of liberty of conscience and the health message. Awesome. I was trying to count your breaths there, about two breaths in the last five minutes, Brother <laughs> Scott. Uh, I myself am strictly vegan between meals. And, um, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, it's interesting you talk about this as maybe like a dry run for the end time crisis. You know, in Daniel chapter 3, that statue was not built overnight. Those three Hebrew boys saw that statue going up day by day, and as government ministers, they knew what was coming. But they didn't leave Babylon. They stayed in Babylon so they might be a witness at that moment of truth. And so it took them, the, it required them the necessity to exercise courage every single day. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to endure to the end, as the book of Revelation says. I'm going to endure to the end because I can see a crisis of conscience coming that will come upon the whole world. And maybe this COVID crisis is an invitation to us to ask ourselves, are we so wedded to the gods of this world? Have we been bought by the materialism of the West? Have we been succumbed by the lies of the, the luxurious lifestyle that so many aspire to that we are willing to sell eternal salvation for a bowl of soup? And so I see this, this, this pandemic as an invitation to us to reflect really on this nature of our walk with God. Um, uh, Brother Zirkel, uh, we had a good conversation in the way here about legal matters and so forth, and I'm glad I wasn't on the clock, but it was, it was, it was a great conversation on the way over here. And I was wondering if you can put up on the, on the screen um, the slide that has the Liberty and Health exemption resources. Um, Liberty and Health have got a great website. We encourage you to check it out, libertyandhealth.org. And uh, they have um, a website there, a page there, that deals with exemption resources. So, Brother Circle, could you just share with us um, what does the EEOC say about religious exemptions when it comes to these vaccines? So the EEOC has actually given specific uh, guidance on these uh, vaccines, specifically COVID. And um, the, in their guidance, they say that if a, if a person makes a religious objection, um, then the employer should go through a process to see if they can make a reasonable accommodation. And it's very important to understand what the EEOC defines as a religious objection. It needs to be religious in nature, but um, here's the deal. It's whatever you believe. It's not what your church believes. It says that, that even if you believe differently than the, the denomination that you belong to, that's okay. The EEO says even if you're the only person on earth that believes this, that's okay. That's a religious belief and that they will support that. Now, the courts, we're living in a time where I'm not sure what the courts are going to do. But I know what the law says, and uh, that's what the EEOC says. And it's really a restatement of American constitutional law, and it's going to also apply. We're having a little more difficult applying this, but, but we're going to get it done. 
applies to students as well. It's not just for em employees. There's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of people that think, oh, you know, students, they don't have as much right as an employee. That's not true. Um, we have to use different statutes, different ways to go about it. We don't get to use the administrative process that the EOC provides. There's a little bit more regular court work that's done, but it can be done. Okay, and uh, um, how do you justify a religious exemption claim? Well, a person just has to say, hey, I have this objection. I, I, and, you know, in, in these cases, primarily we're going after two different things, especially in the Adventist community. The fact that these uh, vaccines, uh, they all contain uh, or were tested on fetal cell lines from abortions. So if you believe in the sanctity of life. Also related to the sanctity of life is the sanctity of your own life. Like, our body is the temple of God, and we're to take care of it. You know, um, you may take other vaccines, but other vaccines are totally different. You listened to, to what our presentation was here earlier. Those are different, different animals, right? And, and just because you take one doesn't mean you, you, you won't take... You, you don't have to take the other. And, and the law even allows you to have a conversion. So maybe you took a vaccine before. Maybe you took a COVID vaccine before, but you went through a conversion. You don't have to take the booster. So, you know, there's a lot of things we can talk about. Adventists are in an incredibly strong position because why don't we smoke cigarettes? They're bad for you. They're bad for your body. It's the exact same thing, you know, once you start to look at the data on, on the vaccine. So we have, we have a strong basis. Uh, we have some members sitting in our congregation tonight. I know in Loma Linda and other places where there are many Adventist physicians and medical professionals who are facing the real prospect of losing their jobs if they, they're going to be fired if they do not take the vaccinations. And so they're facing a real crisis of conscience right now. And um, we discussed this in the van coming back from over here today. Is it better to resign or is it better to be fired and why? So you got to stick around and get fired. As much as you don't want to get fired, that's what you got to do because the courts redress a wrong. And the wrong thing is when they fire you, okay? Now, there's some little wiggle room in some cases where we can go after it if they haven't fired you. But you really need to stay until you're fired. Plus, there's another thing going on. I just received a text where they, they'd done some kind of an informal study at UC Davis in California where they're expecting between, I think it was 25 and 40% of the staff at UC Davis are going to refuse. And so we're playing a giant game of chicken to see who's going to blink first. And if we just hold our ground and we don't blink, I want to say one more thing that's incredibly disheartening to me as a lawyer, and that is when I take a religious liberty case and someone says, oh, man, it's too bad. I don't think I'm going to win I'm, or whatever, and they cave. They go to work on Sabbath or something like that. And I look at them and I go like, man, I was working for all this because I thought you had a religious objection. Okay, if you got a religious objection, have the strength of your conviction. And we are seen to be living in a post-truth society where nobody knows what is true anymore. And yet in this whole COVID crisis, people are yearning for truth. They're yearning for truth about treatment, outpatient treatment protocols, truth about how they can maintain their own health, truth about the vaccines, and truth about um, who they are. And are they just gonna be pushed over? Are they just gonna become a statistic? Or do they stand for something? And so um, truth is really important now in America, in my opinion. People are looking for truth, and truth has a ring to it. And I really appreciate, and I value, and I treasure people who risk everything to stand up for the truth. And I may not understand what you say, like I didn't understand 90% of what you said, Dr. McCullough. <laughs> but I, kn I know that you are risking your entire professional career and your financial progress in life to come and speak to places like this. And Dr. Lewis and Brother Scott and Brother Jonathan, we're all, you're all facing that same moment of truth in life where you have to decide, am I gonna stand for what I believe is right? I just gotta add one thing about this. If you go look in the book of Revelation and you get down towards the end and it talks about who's not going to be in the city and it lists off all these different sins, you know, the whoremongers and all these different things like that. But one of the things it says is it's the people who lack courage. They aren't going to be in the city either. And it's, I, I always found it so amazing because that's not like, I don't see that in the Ten Commandments actually, but it's right there. You got to have courage. We have to stand because if we don't learn to stand now, when will you stand? Man. Okay, that. Brother Scotsman. 
The reference there is Revelation 21. Those outside the city are the fearful, the unbelieving, and all of that. And, and to the point about truth, we, we do seem to live in a post-truth era now, don't we? I mean, philosophically, religiously, and even with science, which you would think is always going to be data-driven. And you have a CDC head that came out just a couple of weeks ago and said, our vaccines can't prevent transmission, yet we're still forcing them on people because if they don't get the vaccine, they will transmit. So take the vaccine to prevent you from transmitting but our vaccines don't prevent transmission. And it, it doesn't compute. Uh, I do seminars on media, obviously, for, for years. People are aware of media on the brain. And th the preparatory stages through the schooling system and in the industrial era schooling models, trying to actually create automatons and the media utilizing methods to, to turn off our thinking capacity. You know, the Bible says that God has not given us a spirit of fear but he's given us a, a, a power and of love and a sound mind. You know, come let us reason together. And so when we are able to do that by his grace and his power and by walking with Jesus Christ daily and studying his word, tuning out all of the, all of the noise from the media and all of the opinions and being people of truth, we've got to bring that back. That's absolutely essential spiritually for a salvational issue in the last days. We invite, we invite people into God's remnant movement because it represents the truth, but we don't say follow the truth and then submit to groupthink. To be an Adventist means to continually search for truth, truth about God, truth about ourselves, to have a closer walk with God, and so we should never seek, um, cease searching for truth no matter where truth leads us. That's what it means to be intellectually and spiritually honest. Dr. Lewis, you were going to add something there. Yeah, I was just going to say a lot of people say, well, I mean, I'm going to lose my job, and I also am going to lose my job unless the Lord works a miracle out as well. But I guess my question is this, and I, I guess I'm appealing to each and every one of us. I'm appealing to myself. If we say we believe something, but we're not willing to suffer loss for it, did we ever really believe it to begin with? I mean, honestly, honestly, it's very easy to say that, but... <laughs> Jesus said, he that prefers father or mother or child or job or you name it above me is not worthy of me. And so I think we have to ask ourselves an honest hearted question. What am I willing to stand for? What do I really believe? And then stand. Expect God to give us the strength and stand. And you will never, you will never regret it. I promise. Amen. Some people would say, though, oh, come on, my health choices, what I eat, and, you know, how I deal with disease, this isn't such a spiritual issue. And that's been put out there that it's not a matter of conscience because health choices are not spiritual choices. They're in a separate category. And, you know, as a Bible-believing Christian, to me, my whole life is spiritual choices. That's all day, every day, especially health choices. Because the Bible says that whatever I eat or drink or whatever I do, I do it all to the glory of God. It says whatever you do, but then specifically names what you put in your body. And so everybody has to prayerfully ask God about that across the whole spectrum of our health choices. It says it's really a worship issue. It says offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual act of worship. As in Romans 12, verse 2, your reasonable service in the King James. So just all of us really during this time, our minds will be clear if we're eating right, if we're exercising, if we're practicing the eight laws of health. We will be finding more joy in Jesus. You'll find if you're, if you're struggling, you have brain fog, just, just life's getting you down, depression, try those eight laws of health out. It is a spiritual quest, and you'll find Christ through that. You'll see him more clearly. He'll reveal himself to you when we live by his laws of health. Uh, thank you very much, Brother Scott. Coming back to you, Brother Jonathan, um, this is kind of a much more uh, mundane kind of question, but if you, are being, if you are facing losing your job, at what point should you contact an attorney, and what kind of attorney would you be looking for? So this is what I tell people. First of all, uh, find out as much as you can. Go to libertyandhealth.org and look at our webpage. Um, when you're at work and you realize that... Uh, if your employer starts to threaten you, say, hey, look, we got, you, you, you got to have a, a vaccine, you know? That's when you look to our webpage. We've got letters there. Try to work it out with your employer. 
okay? Once the employer actually says, ah, I'm not going to accept this, okay? Now you better start looking for a lawyer. And then the day your employer, you're playing this game of chicken, remember? The day your employer actually fires you, that's the day you need to, to have a lawyer. You don't need one for that. But when that day happens, you, you, you need one, okay? Now, if you can afford one, it is nice to have one before it because maybe some things, you know, you might be able to say a little better. But, um, and then if you can't get one the day you've been fired, every state and, and EEOC is nationwide, they've got systems out there that are actually designed for you to go through the system on your own. And so you can be starting the system, starting to make a complaint with EEOC or your local your state, has something like in California, it's the Department of Employment and Fair Housing. You can start that process and then continue to look for a lawyer. Now, when you go to look for a lawyer, um, I th I'm pretty sure we're going to have something up on our web page. Um, we haven't decided how we're going to do it, but we can uh, somehow we're going to help people get hooked up with lawyers. The other thing, too, is that most of these statutes have ways for you to recover attorney's fees. So if you win, your attorney's going to get paid from the other side, from your employer, okay? And there are organizations out there that we're gonna try to work with that will help put some of the upfront costs into the case to help you make it. So there's ways. Watch our webpage, learn more, get that lawyer if you're fired, and go from there. And however we go through that process, maintain a Christ-like attitude. Remember that you're saying, I'm a Christian. If you don't act like a Christian, I believe that's taking the Lord's name in vain. So maintain your Christian demeanor, praying for those who we consider are persecuting us, blessing those who are doing us harm. This is how Jesus taught us how to live through these moments of crisis. And even as we're sitting here in America tonight, um, if you're following the news in, say, Afghanistan, you know, the even, you know, this very week, the Taliban are going from house to house, finding people with Bibles on their cell phones. People are being executed. People are being um, scourged. This is real persecution happening around our world today. And maybe for the first time in our living memory, persecution, uh, not, not so much against Christians, but, but against people who insist on holding to a conscience in really a godless age, this is now coming to our shores. And this is where we have to decide what do we stand for and what are we going to bow to. Dr. Lewis, uh, do you want to uh, conclude it for us? I know you have a stirring um, appeal for us to be men and women of courage and to choose when we stand. Well, before I answer that, I do want to tell you all one more thing that Liberty and Health Alliance is working on. One thing that we dreamed of was exemptions from the get-go exemptions, and praise the Lord, we've been able to offer that. But another thing that we're working on avidly is telemedicine for early treatment, which is what Dr. McCullough was sharing with us. There's a lot of people. I myself have suffered, and there are many, many who are suffering. And so that is something that we're working on. If that's something that you're interested, you can go to our website as well, libertyandhealth.org. But I do want to leave us all with a thought, and it kind of goes along with what we've already been talking about. You know, we have the example in Daniel 1, and you were just talking, Mr. Ritzema, of these three worthies and Daniel. And there they were. They were put in a situation where their health was being tested. And they had the choice with their own lives of either just kind of going along to get along or making a stand. And they took a stand, and God blessed. And that strengthened them, I believe, to when we come a couple chapters later, they were strengthened to be able to undergo the much harder test. And I think something similar may be happening in our time. This is not the mark of the beast, but the decisions that we make today, little by little by little, Jesus can strengthen our courage, strengthen us to be stronger, to stand for harder, more difficult tests, whatever they may be as they come up. So I just want to leave us with the idea that Jesus will give us strength to stand for what is right. If we make a decision, all we have to say is, Jesus, give me strength, and he will strengthen us, and he will, regardless of the outcome, he will give us peace, that peace that passeth all human understanding. Amen.
Amen. You want to, um, just a little uh, programming detail. When you go over to libertyandhealth.org, put in the email address, because Mr. Zirkel, as well as another attorney named Jonathan Cherney, they did a wonderful live stream just a couple of days ago. And you may have a lot of questions, because this was very brief, right, about, about exemptions, and we'll have more on that tomorrow. But um, we can share that with you, or just send me an email, scottritzema at gmail.com. We can send you that live stream so that you can hear a lot of questions and answers that, that were asked. And also, uh, Mr. Zirkel's working on an FAQ page for libertyandhealth.org for all the multitude of questions about the legal issues. So scottritzema at gmail.com. I can send you the link or go over to the website and be sure to sign up for the email updates and you'll get that. I just want to say that I, I really do want to encourage everyone to stand up, uh, especially stand up with the courage not to get the vaccine if that's what you've been convicted to do. I don't want to leave everyone here thinking that a lawsuit is the best way to settle everything. Um, read, I, I tell people, and when you're talking to your employer, when you are talking about why you're not taking the vaccine, but also when you're making a decision whether to go after your employer or not, maybe because they're violating your rights, read James 1, uh, verse 5 and verse 6. Pray that the Lord will give you wisdom and then the wisdom that he gives you, stand for it unwaveringly. And, and I know, I, I think this world is changing pretty fast, but we need to cling tight to the Lord, and he'll get us through this thing. And when Jesus comes again, there'll be people who are vaccinated and unvaccinated in the Lamb's Book of Life. <laughs> Which means, Man. No, matter, no matter what you choose, do it in good conscience. Do it because the Holy Spirit is convicting you. Live in love with your brothers and sisters. Do not condemn them for the decisions they make, but celebrate with them day by day the incredible gift of life and the promise of eternal life. Amen. Thank you, panel. Let's give them a hand. I think I'd like to echo uh, Jonathan Zirkel's comments that if you don't live a principled Christian life and all of a sudden you're asserting your liberties in Christ, it is probably a form of blasphemy to the name of Jesus. So uh, Americans are liberty-loving people, but I know of no one that legitimately owns liberty without owning responsibilities. So may the Lord help us to be consistent, principled, humble, Dignified, let's do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. Let's offer to others what we want offered to ourselves. And may God help us. We're going to have prayer. You'll be dismissed from the back by the deacons while the piano is playing. And we thank you for your attendance this evening. Remember, tomorrow the fellowship meal is for out-of-town guests. If you live close, the service will end at 1 o'clock if you're here. If you're coming only for the afternoon, it begins at 2.30. Let's stand as we pray. Lord, you've offered us wonderful liberty in Christ. May we not exercise it without understanding the corresponding dynamics of responsibility. I pray, Lord, that we would exercise wisdom, grace. Thank you, Lord, for a free country. Thank you for the evaluation and examination of ideas. And as we go forward into this weekend, may we be men and women, young people, children, with honest hearts, true spirits, and may we let Jesus be the light for all things which primarily have to do with the little sacrifices that have nothing even to do with COVID. So now, Lord, bless us as we rest. Thank you for this forum. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. If you will...
exit out. It's a beautiful evening. You'll be dismissed from the back. Please stay seated until the deacons dismiss you. God bless you, and we hope you can join us tomorrow.